Seems like Greg, Greg, you watched it? I did. Fantastic. Yep. Make sure, to Make sure you, yeah, you're talking to the mic. Hello. How about that? It's just a thing you have to remind him. Well, the mic should come to me, not vice versa. Let's go ahead and start right there. Greg Cody of the Miami Herald is in with us on Tuesdays, as he usually is, and he is now in the physically breaking portion of the proceedings. His hand is wrapped in gauze and tape, and uh, really it goes up to ha- almost to his elbow. Well, it's, it's poorly taped, if we're being honest. You're coming in aggressive on your injured father very Thank early. You. We've had some complaints recently that you and I are too mean to your father on Tuesdays. Uh, why? What happened here? Greg, are you at the age now where you can't brush against a, a cabinet without bleeding? <laughs> His hands have taken a step back in the last few months. Like, Dad, you have old hands now. It's a thing yeah. that's kind of... Uh, unfortunately, I have old forearms. Yeah. Like, it, my dad, really... too. Yeah. If my dog jumps on, on my dad, he's like gushing blood for hours. Yeah. Did you lotion a lot? Like in the la- like in your forties? I, I, no, no. I've just now begun to lotion. Ooh, I lotion. My, you know, these are the the the. They get all the UV rays. The forearms. There, there was a comedian. I don't know who it was. Whether it was Jeff Ross or someone else who talked about aging and how easily, when you age, you bruise. And the conversation that he had with an old person. Uh, an old bruised person who explained that what had happened to her was the wind. <laughs> it happens. <laughs> the wind. It's coming for all of us, man. Well, <laughs> you you have dyed your mustache. Yes, sir. I Whoa. have. I have. In an aggressive move in my war against aging, I have dyed my mustache. Do I like the results? No, not particularly. I thought that was only for the soups. Yeah, well, it was a soups exclusive. You're going to find out when I dye my mustache, you'll be the first to know for $2.99 a month. Unbelievable. No, I have. Uh, I saw some grays peeking in there. Uh-huh. And like Mark Jackson said, you tell your body not today. I'm telling you right now, 2022 is not only the year that the internet started working for me, it is the year that I started reversing the aging process by not taking any self-responsibility. I am not changing anything about myself whatsoever. It's just going to be dye and camouflage right. and an assortment Back, of things. Guess what? I'm doubling down. I, I'm I'm doing worse things to my body oh, at no. 36. Oh no. Yes, yes. That's what we're doing now. And science better catch up. In the meantime, I'll hold things together through duct tape and just for men. Are you <laughs> considering Botox? And- am I considering Botox, brother? Botox is absolutely a certainty. <laughs> Filler is what I'm considering. <laughs> Hair transplants necessary uh, well, off in the future? Your boy rallied. Your boy rallied yeah. after a very low point. The, the keeps worked. The uh, uh, Pellicreccio. Uh, no, it's a Crecci Pedro. I'm sorry, from Brazil. <laughs> that actually really worked for me. All natural alternatives. Am I happy with the Entradas? No. Am I taking the L? Not just yet. If we see some recession, your boy's hopping on the first bird to Turkey. (laughs) Istanbul, here I come. Greg Cody going to Turkey for his forearm. What happened? Because you have it wrapped almost halfway up the forearm, and above the forearm, there's a lot of scarring. Yeah. I had a kitchen mishap on Sunday. Uh, It was pretty bad, actually. And and this is uh, cosmetic. This is not something I need as much as it's something that hides what would be Pretty ugly bandaging. Mm. Um, basically, uh, I was cooking uh, a rump roast, which uh, is a beautiful cut of meat. You love butt. Well, this is not a Boston butt. No, this is a rump. Yeah, the the Boston. Yeah. The Boston. You also eat rump, though. I do. Yeah. Yeah, I eat rump. The, I'm sorry. I thought that this had something to do with the shoulder, and that the shoulder had something to do with the butt. Well, that's interesting. You should you say like that. You like eating rump? I do. That's I not love. for everybody. No, no, I, I like rump. More butt yeah, than too. rump? It, it has to be cooked perfectly. The Boston butt is a cut of meat that's on the shoulder of the pig, not the butt. But the rump roast on the cow... Is the actual asshole. Is, it's not the asshole. No, that's pepperoni. <laughs> no, the, but, but the rump roast is the closest thing to the tail. You it's on the, Look it up. It's on the rear of the cow. Anyway, long story short... Shut up. I had you, a big, you, didn't, you didn't know that about pepperoni? No. Pepperoni's the asshole. I thought of the those cow. were nipples. Stop it. No, no. no I'm not having the that. cow is an udder. I Can love you imagine pepperoni. the uttered nipples on top of a pizza? You'd know. 
Pepperoni is not the asshole. Yes, I'm it is. Googling I it took is a Miami Dade College. Oh, that class. can't be true. No because pepperoni that's is the true. worst thing. I that's love not pepperoni. Just repurposed cow asshole. No, that's not. Wow. That can't be factually <laughs> okay. correct. All right, no. we're Urban looking dictionary it up. Pepperoni and butthole pizza. That mm. can't be right. Anyway, continue. Okay. Anyway, it's a six and a half pound rump roast, which is pretty big. Uh, I'm giving it uh, prior to slow cooking it in the oven. I'm giving it a nice sear, so it's got that nice brown, that little crust before it goes in the oven. In the process of searing it in in a, a thin layer of hot oil, I mistakenly drop the six and a half pound hunk of meat. Oil splashes up on me, really bad. I dropped the tongs. I exclaimed. My wife thought I'd had a heart attack. Curse word. It might have been a curse word. Might have been the f word. Searing. Did you hear the sizzling on your skin? <laughs> I didn't, but it immediately bubbled and blistered, and you know it's re- hot oil is re- a really ugly thing to look at. Hence the bandage, but uh, but I'm fine. And and the rump actually turned out pretty good. It was it was a little on the medium rare side. I probably should have left it in the oven a, an extra ten minutes, but still, Greg, it was good. Did you consider wearing long sleeves today? You know, I didn't. You should do that because right now you're taking an optics L in the war against aging. Right. If you just wore long sleeves, nobody would know. Well, it, well that's not true because he didn't shave today. And when he doesn't, uh, when he hair yeah. dye? when he doesn't shave, he needs a lot of hair <laughs> dye. Do. Yes. I need what you got. Yeah, I want what he winning. has. Salt's winning. Yeah, we cannot let this happen. No, no, this is this is bad. This is pure laziness. Mike, here. is this your first uh, this your first effort in the dye I'll category? Never tell. Well, but you just you. Just... It's my fifth. You never noticed, uh, which is great for me. Well, how did you feel about? You said this you didn't is the like most it. aggressive one. My wife told me I look like a professional wrestler. Uh, so I, but I but it was Mike, in the dark, so I but, knew it was bad. I, I think if you didn't draw attention to it, we wouldn't have noticed. No, That's see, true. this is what you do. You neuter it on the front end. I am telling you, yeah. the audience, that I will not lose this war against Father Time. I will make aggressive maneuver after aggressive maneuver. I will look like Siegfried and Roy by 2025. And I don't give a damn. You're going to watch me beat this thing. Pepperoni, the search for pepperoni and what I believe is a blatant falsehood. I don't want to say what I found on the internet. Involving pepperoni? It, it, Urban Dictionary says that like if you have a butt with a bunch of pimples on it, that's pepperoni. I'm okay. telling you, I took a health class at MDC. <laughs> A very respectable you institution. You can't go to the definition of pepperoni at Urban Dictionary. Well, I mean, seriously. <laughs> so you think the actual definition of pepperoni is asshole? He's making. He's saying, "Look it up." He's throwing. Am it I telling you? I'm assuming this is like an Urban Dictionary no, thing you're referring to. No, I took to. a health class. He's like, pepperoni is the worst thing that that you could eat because it's made from the worst part. I'm not finding. I'm that. not going to tell you they're going to go out of the way specifically to slice the asshole because at that point. Pepperoni's a commodity. Roy's been but on it's a, a, in and around the ass. Roy's been on a pepperoni deep dive. Are you finding anything that confirms what Mike's saying? No. Okay. Have I, you any, seeing... Wait, wait. Have you found anything that debunks what I'm saying? <laughs> no. Okay. The burden of proof is on you, not on me. I mean, that is so unfair. I'm seeing I'm it's, trying. it's a sausage made from Berkshire Park shoulder and flavored with fennel pollen shoulder. rather than the usual fennel seed, no. paprika, and cayenne. <laughs> wait no. a minute. Also, by the way, what pepperoni, the not an Italian creation. It's an Italian-American creation, mm-hmm. a la chicken parmesan. Oh, yeah. Yep. In Italy, you don't see pepperoni pizza. Yep. In America, they don't want you to know what pepperoni is made out of. No one's actually asked the question, hey, where does this meat come from? It's the asshole. Is it the asshole of a cow or a pig? Depends on no, what part of the country you're No, that's not what at. we're finding Maybe on the both. internet. And at Lebitard Show, please put it on the poll. Did you know that pepperoni was American and not Italian? Look at all you guys. Towing, uh, towing the company line over here for uh, big pepperoni. I'm telling you right now, <laughs> there's asshole in that pepperoni. Okay, you keep saying that, and I'd like you to stop saying that because we haven't found anywhere I'm that sorry, it is factual. I'm sorry, you're a big fan of Marlins 5? Huh? <laughs> oh, Every yeah. time Inter Miami draw or win, you're out there with the Papa code? I get you. I get you. No judgment. Just know you're eating asshole. I believe that we did not spend enough time last week talking about the proper two pizzas to buy if you're only buying two pizzas for a group. I know you talked about it some, Stugatz. Uh, we were all amazed. We're always awed when Stugatz goes into his own pocket and uh, gives. And uh, Stugatz bought pizza last week. He brought. Yeah. He, and oh, yeah, and we were right talking here. about what is the proper. What are the you proper. guys are lying? Stugatz did. Oh, no, yeah. he did. He did. He paid for all of it. Yes. Didn't expense it. No. People, well, we don't know yet about yeah. that. We don't know what will come in from Lake Placid. The work week he just had this week and the one hour he did from a Pilates room in Lake Placid. Uh, so it might get expensed. But 
What is the proper order of two pizzas, Greg, if you are ordering for a room of people and not asking anybody what they want? Uh, you have to go a plain cheese and you have to go pepperoni. That's obvious. That's what I just said. No, okay. I'm, just, I mean, no, 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 no. I'm, I'm, I'm saying to Dan, like, I feel like that's a consensus answer. Right. Yeah. And uh, that is just, no wonder the conversation didn't go anywhere. If everyone just agreed, if for the first time ever in the history of discourse, uh, people just agreed, yeah, those are the two that you have to buy no matter what. No well, dissent. It's when there's an anarchy. And so people start going for spicy pepperoni oh, on, and stop. sweet stop. pepperoni. Stop, that was delicious. Don't if do you that. say meat lovers, it's like, no, too much. Too much. Chris, this was spicy pepperoni with a little drizzle of hot honey on top. I mean, delicious. that's Little ricotta honey. cheese on that top. Oh, nice. my God, it was delicious. I'm not going to eat honey. It's a rage now, honey yeah. is yeah. so good. I, I, the only time I do eat pepperoni is with hot honey. Mm -hmm. Man, that's the best. Uh -huh. honey. Yeah, Wait, you've see, never had Mike's hot honey is great. No, oh, uh, no. Not a paid endorsement. Not a pizza ingredient. So, you, so you don't eat pepperoni in other contexts because no. because you think it's made oh, I from. Didn't. I took a health class at MDC. What you telling me? My my professor at the esteemed illustrious Miami Dade College <laughs> is lying to me. I've got a, a question for Greg Cody uh, that I don't know the answer to. But when you said, "God, no, I haven't had hot honey," I want an honest answer to the question I'm about to ask. When is the last time you tried anything new? Anything new? Just when is the last time you chose to learn, you chose change, you chose anything that you just decided for the sake of I'm not formed and I'm not intellectually yeah. lazy, I will always be curious, the last time you decided to uh, okay. try something? Yeah, in, in, in the spirit of consumables, uh, I was in my, my local market I saw a bag, a bag of snacks that really appealed to me. I bought it. I'd never had it. It was uh, sriracha spiced uh, chickpeas, but they were baked chickpeas. They were like crunchy, um, sublime, just the best <laughs> ever. And I'd never had that. It was a new experience. And now it's like, I, I can't get enough. Greg Cody on behalf of learning. Thank Last you. time I tried something new is I applied a raw potato to my face and it really brightened my skin. I'm taking the holistic approach, too. No stone left unturned. I wasn't asking you. I've grown a, a great deal weary of uh, of the amount of offerings. Like you haven't rubbed a raw potato on your face. <laughs> Here's it doesn't work with papa rellenos, though, by the way, so you may want to chill that. What about a cooked potato? <laughs> yeah, right. Try that one. Here's an experiment I want everybody to try. Uh, you know, you taste through the sense of smell. If you put a blindfold on and you pinch your nose so that you absolutely cannot smell anything, you cannot tell that unless you're guessing because it's 50-50, you cannot taste the difference between a raw potato and an apple. Fascinating. You're you're lying right now. Let's no, do you're right. Test no, me. Not. Let's right. do it. I'll bite into that thing and be like, "That's clearly a potato." <laughs> no, not you, not wait. if you're blindfolded with no sense of smell. Can you rub an apple on your face? Just just checking. Absolutely. No yeah. Left unturned. Sure. Do it all the time. One of the things that I wanted to discuss with you guys because Greg Cody wrote a column about it this morning, and I have my remorses about some things that happened yesterday, chief among them because we were live, that we were giving opinions that were either incomplete or obsolete the moment that the report from the arbitrator came out on the Deshaun Watson case. And so I, I regret that during the doing of a live show, uh, there was not time because it came out after the show to go over or to wait to have an opinion until the information from somebody who was paid to be a, a neutral party to navigate a conflict, I regret. I made a mistake in not waiting that out before offering an opinion. And I fell on some of my formed opinions because, A, I'm still learning as some of this stuff happens. And I'll tell you about that in a second. But also uh, because... What we are seeing with this case is so unprecedented from an athlete, all of it, the guaranteed money, the conversation around it in an era of punishing athletes, I should have waited to form the hardened opinion, but the instantaneous, emotional, fast reaction put me in a position where basically I'm checkmated on a losing argument 
because at the end of this transaction, I now want to give Goodell a power I've been wanting to take away from him for for since he's had it. Right. And really, is it the source of this conflict? Because if he could get along with his partners, the players union, and hadn't again and again lost their trust, he would not now be in the position where he's fighting them. He's winning according to the arbitrator on every single point. Sexual assault was committed. Yes. According to the NFL, the NFL proved its case to an independent arbiter. And really what happened yesterday is the penalty is light. It's twofold. There's time served, right? Because whether you believe it was a suspension, full paid, he did miss a season of his prime. That is a punishment. Yeah, but it's but a not punish- because of that. No, it's a, you have to also apply the context that he was trying to force his way out of Houston before all of that happened. Right. He sat out last season. He didn't miss it as any kind of punishment for all these allegations. Well, but it was counted as time served by everybody. And whatever it is that you have to say, I'd love to make millions not working and everything else, uh, it still is a punishment to not be able to play and to have your name spear- smeared. Uh, not punishment enough. And then yesterday comes down and six games felt appalling. Yep. It, it, it felt... No matter what your tribe is on this, and people line up, black, woman, athlete, is it my team? I'm tired of black people being tried in the press. People take their sides. The reason that I wish that I had more information yesterday is because it seems like what happened is that this woman ruled against Goodell's ability to make up the rules as he goes along on what these punishments are. That she agreed that the NFL proved its case. I was not aware until yesterday, an off-air conversation with Jessica. I was not aware. I'd always associated in my mind, and because I come from privilege too, that violence is physical. That it's physical violence. That that's how I define it. And the reasons that things were made in, in, in nuance and context between Trevor Bauer's situation and Deshaun Watson is that Deshaun Watson was not viewed as a physical threat, but she even ruled that he was a danger to others. She ruled that he stained the NFL shield by using his status as an NFL quarterback to lure women into what was a violent situation, whether you define it as physical violence or not. There was a phrase, nonviolent sexual assault, that felt oxymoronic to me. I thought if it's sexual assault, it's almost going to always be violent. Like yeah. that, I thought assault and nonviolent, those two things can't be in a phrase together. And I did not find, like Mina Kime, she thought the ruling was incoherent and confusing. To me, it was not incoherent and confusing. She sided with the NFL on everything and then said, based on precedent, this is not how you punish. You don't punish this way. You cannot set a new set of rules. They said, but it's unprecedented. The crime's unprecedented. The number of people, unprecedented. It doesn't compare to anything else. We need an unprecedented penalty. And... Her response was, no, you don't get to do that when you're in with a league partner on something like this, where the players have a power that you, the commissioner, are no longer trusted with, and now you're trying to do the same thing that you've always done to punish extremely, and she wouldn't allow it even as she sided with him. I I made a point in the column that that I want to reiterate, because part of this is that there was precedent for a harsher punishment. In 2017, Ezekiel Elliott uh, was suspended the same six games. Okay, he had been accused of domestic abuse. That case, like this one, was not criminally prosecuted because the the uh, state attorney's office at the time said there was conflicting evidence. In, in Deshaun Watson's case, there was not conflicting evidence. There were two dozen women saying the same thing. But not the arbiter didn't have access to all of those women. And again, the, the reason she said this is an un... She defined violence as non-violence. Yeah. She was saying the CDC as is... non-aggressive yeah, non-aggressive. physical violence, which I'm with Mina on that one. It, it sounds oxymoronic. I enjoyed yes. our discourse yesterday. I actually thought while well, many people were whiffing, we did nail the, the important part, which is, no, she said he did this. 
Yes. He did this. He did this, and we'll get to what the Browns said afterwards because I'm very curious to see how they pivot. And you've already seen one asinine statement. I can't from the believe Haslam. they use the word triggered in their statement. They use the word triggered and the fact that Deshaun Watson has displayed public remorse since when? Zero. Zero. Yeah, and, and the remorse. arbiter said that too. Yeah, and that's part of part of my problem with this whole thing. But is uh, he, basically he's calling two dozen women. Uh, a liar, and he continues to do so. And to me, the the important distinction in this is you can say Deshaun Watson got off easily, and he did, but do not say that he was exonerated. Okay. He Let, was found guilty. Let's stay here for a while because throughout this process, the Browns maintained they did their own investigation and they thought that Deshaun Watson would come out clean. They believed in Deshaun. They believed that he was doing the work, even though he admitted that he had no work to do because he did nothing wrong. You now have this investigation, and the result is the NFL met the burden of proof that the five cases they took into account, Deshaun Watson sexually assaulted them. You have now learned through an investigation, through a ruling from an independent arbiter, that you have a serial sexual assaulter in your locker room that has shown zero remorse. Now what? Oh, he's, he's still on your roster. We, we, we stand by him. He's, he's done all the right things. Fuck you. That's what I say. Because you had a historic amount of allegations against this guy. You said you did your due diligence. Now you found out that he lied to your face? Okay? What like now you want to keep him in your in your huddle? Now you're that bullshit contract that you gave him where you limited his financial liability. I am so pissed off at the Cleveland Browns. The fact that they're standing by Kevin Stefanski said he stands by the ruling of the judge. Okay, then you stand by the ruling that says the quarterback that is leading your team sexually assaulted five women. Five. The five that they heard. How does this make sense to anybody? This is insane. One of the things that bubbled forth yesterday and is bubbling forth now, right, is we are attacking blame on all sides for systemic failures. Go right to the top of Texas, which has brutally, brutally standards, high standards of proof when it comes to convicting or indicting on this. Like, compared to the country, it's unusually high. So what isn't an exoneration can be waved around as something that feels like an exoneration. As people say, this is not a criminal. He hasn't even been indicted on two counts. You've already punished, or he hasn't been indicted twice. And they do view it as a bit of an exoneration or innocent until proven guilty. Then the next step on that, because I want to talk how this would be playing out right now if this was the Dolphins, Greg, because you, uh, the Dolphins, by their own incompetence, merely avoided having this in their huddle. But if the problem is so systemic that Texas isn't good at handling it, the law isn't good at handling it, the NFL got involved with this way in over its head and is trying to do better work than the law as a conservative organization run by old billionaires trying to at least look like they're being aggressive with the penalty and not being allowed to because of the systemic failure of when they got involved in this business. Their partners, the players, don't trust them to do this on the up and up, Tom Brady will not give them the phone. The arbiter is saying, my credibility comes from the credibility of NFL investigators. This, what I am viewing as credible, credible evidence that proves the NFL's case is these investigators that I believe to be credible. Even though those investigations have been flawed before. But she is taking the word of the NFL incentivized here to punish deeply that he is guilty of all of this. And she is citing this because this to me was the sentence that, that was the decision. It wasn't about any of this other noise. It was about this sentence. I am bound by fair and consistent disciplinary determination. It's as, it's as simple to her as what are the precedents here. This is the stiffest penalty I've ever given for a crime that she's saying she's defining as nonviolent. She's defining it as nonviolent. That's abhorrent. I don't think any of the victims would agree that it's nonviolent. And and lifelong bruises sometimes are invisible, but they're there. And I I just think it's it's abhor abhorrent the way this ended on so many levels. The the two sides, the NFLPA slash Watson and the NFL tried to compromise this. They tried for an agreement before the penalty phase. The NFL wanted at least 
uh, 12 games and an $8 million fine. Uh, Watson's side wanted a minimum, a maximum of six to eight games. So the the uh, disciplinary officer gave the low end of what the NFL PA would have agreed to without a fine for a $230 million guaranteed contract. You can't find this guy. And there's no precedent for this because all these other incidents are individual incidents of domestic abuse and such. This is a serial uh, sexual abuser. 25 cases. And the fact that 24 of the 25 have now been settled, that's also not an exoneration. Settling a case uh, does not mean uh, he isn't guilty. I do think you mentioned a sentence. I think it was worth noting uh, the first paragraph of the conclusion of the judge's report where she writes, the NFL may be a forward-facing organization, but it is not necessarily a forward-looking one. Just as the NFL responded to violent conduct after a public outcry, so it seems the NFL is responding to yet another public outcry about Mr. Watson's conduct. At least in the former situation, the policy was changed and applied proactively. Here, the NFL is attempting to impose a more dramatic shift in its culture without the benefit of fair notice to and consistency of consequence for those in the NFL subject to the policy. Meaning that the NFL has never never been forward thinking about any of this. They always respond to, oh, Ray Rice happens. We have to change the violent sexual assault policy. Now this happens. So now they're trying to, on the fly, change the non-violent, as it has been defined by the judge, sexual violence or, or, or sexual assault policy. And so the failure in leadership you talked about yesterday is true. This has been a failure of leadership to see at any point what could be happening down in the future. And they were not proactive enough to set a policy to where they could punish Deshaun Watson more. This is a failure of policymaking more than it is about proving their case. They proved their case, as as we've discussed. It's been proven. It's not just they just that. couldn't it's, it's, have it the is, vision it to change It is like this. After all of those pages, not her 16 pages, but the 215 pages submitted by the investigators, what yesterday's ruling was, was, yes, NFL, you are right about count one, you are right about count two, you are right about count three. This was sexual assault also you cannot punish that way because you've never done it before you can't make up the rules on your league partners it was it's where this the reason we got to arbitration is because the union for years has been fighting the power of goodell to do this and they just got slapped by a judge saying you can't punish that way not when you have partners that are your players and you cannot you cannot be an authoritarian you don't get to make all the rules which puts me in the position inconsistent with all my others over the years of and now what do you do Goodell, well, you appeal it, and then you hear it yourself because there is another step to this. He could just rule it, yes. which is which runs counter to everything I've wanted here, right. and I just happen to agree that he should just rule it in this one instance. I will give <laughs> yeah. you the power. I will trust you only here. I think you're afforded that hypocrisy after processing it. Yeah, it runs against I would argue that it is well within his power because he has that lever that he can pull. That was also collectively bargained that he can appeal it. They did give themselves that failsafe. And I think this time, in the wake of an unprecedented amount of allegations, one that the independent arbiter ruled was unprecedented and conceded that fact, that you drop the hammer with your appeal. You you can say that, though, and I can hear the people who want a dissenting opinion in this room saying that you cannot go through all of these steps that you went through and then at the end, you're right. It, it's counterintuitive leadership because he would be leading and doing the difficult thing to continue to fight this, continue to keep it in the news stream. Nobody believes that's going to happen, right? Don't most no. people believe that this is the end of it? It's dicey. I, I do think it's incumbent upon those in the media like Mina, like this show, to keep pressing the cast and making sure that they get this one right. What kind of workplace is this? Imagine any workplace in this country, there is an investigation where one of the employees was alleged to have committed five. Let's let's give them five. Five incidents, five allegations of sexual assault. The investigation ruled that that employee did indeed commit sexual assault. Where in America does that employee get to keep his job, number one? And number two, get to trot out onto a field to cheers. And guaranteed giant money. But yep. what do you do with the counter, Greg Cody, before we get to how it is that the Dolphins ended up in this, where 
you're going through the steps and Deshaun Watson twice has not been indicted. Deshaun Watson did sit out all of last season. Right. Deshaun Watson is not being cost a lot of money, but is now sitting out six more games of a season. We are punishing him. What you're hearing now is an objection. That's not a strong enough punishment for what Mike's saying. It's right. a sexual, it's sexual assault after sexual assault. That's not usually allowed to work. But when the people in the audience who say no, that's enough. That's enough on Deshaun Watson. He hasn't been found guilty of anything. The arbiter has, but in a court of law, a black man in Texas was not indicted twice. Right. Two grand juries said no. What do you do with all of that when the counter is there has been punishment here and there hasn't been proven in a law, in a, in a courtroom, right. that he is guilty? Okay. That's to come because there is one civil suit against him. There will be a trial unless this one is settled as well, and there's no indication it will be. So there will be a day in court when he has to testify under oath and his accuser has to testify. That's coming. Probably, uh, I don't know when, but it's coming. You know, That's not really an answer to my question, though. Like, it's coming is not an answer to my question. Uh, can I take a stab at it? We have enough evidence. Of to course. suggest that he did this. Yes. And and when citing, you're right to cite the the, the criminal um, charges that were not brought forth. They also didn't listen to all the allegations. We're, we're, we're seeing a very small sample, and we're hearing evidence on a small sample, and we have leaks trickling out on since-settled allegations. Within their judgment, they said Deshaun Watson can only get massage therapy through team employees from here on out. They are protecting women. Through contractual after, language. After the reporting was that NDAs were already being sent out with the Texans, and they had to settle a bunch of cases yeah, because bunch. of that. More than th more than that, 30. Through real, you know. through real sports interviews, through leaked testimony, through in NFL investigations, through grand jury uh, possible indictments, we have enough to know that Deshaun Watson was a monster during this period. And I am fully on board with Roger Goodell giving off the optics that he'd be abusing the power to absolutely drop the hammer. I'm not saying banish him from the league. We can have that conversation. Henry Ruggs, we all know, gone. As soon as he does that, gone. I think there's a place for, if you have 25 allegations of sexual assault and you're able to, to prove a good percentage of them, that's all she wrote too. We can add that discussion, but I'm not going to argue that. I Fine, but drop the hammer on him for this here. You cannot let this guy get away with this. It's very important to, to note, again, that Deshaun Watson was not suspended last season. He missed last season of his own volition because he, was, he had a dispute with the club. He sat out last season. It was he mutually was not suspended. To, to, to frame it correctly, it was mutually beneficial. It was great for the Texans to have that problem not be a Greg, problem. Greg, he would have liked to have played. Like, he wasn't going to sit out the season. Well, he was asking for a trade. That's why I, he sat I, out I, the I, season. I, well, no, but... No, there were extenuating circumstances. The NFL got very lucky. Like, uh, you can't frame this as just Deshaun's choice. It served everybody to have him not play a year in his prime. That wouldn't have been his optimal choice. Here, here's a timeline. It started leaking out that Deshaun Watson wanted out of, Tex uh, of Houston, Texas. And then all these teams were calling on Deshaun Watson. And during the pursuit of Deshaun Watson, we were doing the rumor mill shows. What do you give up for Deshaun Watson? These allegations started trickling in. And then all of a sudden, the leverage that Deshaun Watson had seemingly went out the window. And then it was assumed, okay, is he going to get suspended? Will he play out the string now because he doesn't actually have the power to force his way to another team right now? The assumption was that if the NFL didn't suspend him, he would play out the string. The NFL and the Houston Texans and Deshaun Watson's camp probably came to an agreement that said, you know what? can show up to practice maybe occasionally, maybe use a facility, but as far as game day, you are an optics problem, and we are not trotting you out there because it's mutually beneficial for us to protect our trade asset because the Texans got a haul for Deshaun Watson. If they trot him out there, a player that has had injuries in his past, they run that risk. I also think, I want to mention that there has to be an admission here by Deshaun Watson of some kind. If I'm running the Cleveland Browns right now, uh, I'm the owner of the Browns. I have Deshaun Watson, my general manager, the head coach, in a room, and I'm like, we 
have to put this behind us. And the the best way to do that, the only way we're going to even come close to closure here is for Deshaun to say something that isn't, I have no regrets. Because you cannot keep calling 25 women liars when the NFL has just said, you're guilty. There was evidence. That's why you were suspended. Oh, but I understand how he would arrive at a place at this point if he's in front of an arbiter not showing remorse and showing no one remorse. And if whatever he's doing, feeling like a victim, I understand why it is that he would object to your idea of he's got to go out there and fake contrition. He's got to go out there, be contrite for others. For- I don't think he's ever over this. If he doesn't show some sort of remorse yeah, fake, and some fake admission, it, fake it. But like the team is already faking it for him. They just straight up lied in their statement. They said that he's shown remorse. He, he has hasn't. never done that. He has never done that. He was asked, "Are you going to seek treatment for what?" I've never. I didn't do anything wrong. But what does that soothe? What does that? Play, please explain to me what you guys believe gets healed. By and and look, I would like him to believe it and say it. Feel it in your heart and and admit that you learned something or that you you didn't whatever. Just they, they, they lied to us throughout this entire process. They the Browns and Deshaun Watson did, and their statement right now was bullshit. And if they're going to keep maintaining that, they need to be called out on it. Lean into it. Lean into it. Yeah, yeah. We knew that this was happening, and we'll, we'll have faith that he's a changed man after he went through this, and he won't do it again. But yes. We have come to grips with the fact that we gave up massive draft capital for a serial sexual assaulter. America loves contrition, right? If there's any of it from Deshaun Watson, maybe it makes 25 women feel a little bit better. Oh, Greg. Maybe it makes Browns fans able to cheer for him with a little bit cleaner conscience. I don't, don't, man, maybe I'm being an idiot about this, but I believe that that people have made up their minds here. And no matter what the redemption story is, him going out and saying a few words just to placate you so he could be sufficiently broken, I'm not sure it actually buys him very much. I don't think he's placating me. I think he's he's making 25 women feel a little bit better. No, he's not going to make the women feel better. But I I do get Dan's cynicism here. But I do think that there's merit to what Greg is saying. There are several Browns fans out there that just want something to rationalize, still rooting for that orange helmet. Just give me right. something. Yes. Make me feel a little bit better about this. In public contrition, you will have Browns fans, many who are at training camp asking for autographs that have already made that, that rationalization. You will have some that be like that will be like, okay, well, he's sorry, and everybody deserves a second chance and, and, we'll and move forward. And I would argue that these women accusers – We'll feel a little bit of vindication because right now they've been called liars uh, for two years. um, It may be there, maybe there, but what we're talking about here, no one in this room is qualified to talk about whether after being sexually assaulted, um, a few words at a microphone from a quarterback who hasn't been contrite before uh, would, would help soothe at all. I think... When the Browns are sending out a statement that tr- has the word trigger in it, they are triggering. I think that there are a lot of things around here that hurt uh, and regurgitate this. And one of them is that Deshaun Watson is going to be playing next year. It looks Unless Goodell steps in with something that I haven't seen reported. We'll talk to uh, later in the show. If you're tired of this, Jamel Hill and Mike Florio are going to be on to talk about it later in the show as well. Uh, unless Goodell does something I'm not seeing reported that he's considering doing, uh, Deshaun Watson will win and will be on a field running into the gladiator spectacle with those words or without those words. And he will be celebrated again on Sundays in a way that will hurt again and again because the system failed. It fell on the victims. And now future victims are not incentivized in any way to have it be easier to come forward because the entire system caved in on their heads like they did. They did not win here. They don't even get a dollop of contrition. Uh, as the NFL says, yes, a sexual assaulter will play quarterback for it. The discussion changed yesterday. People that were giving Deshaun the benefit of the doubt or defending, or at least giving the optics that they were defending Deshaun Watson, said, innocent until proven guilty. These are just allegations. They could be lying. Now you have the result of the investigation. He did it. Now what? You're okay with that? Because you kept holding on the line that maybe these women were lying. 
Maybe it was all circumstantial. Maybe it was just a mix-up. He did it. The Browns have shown that they're okay with it so far by their ridiculous statements. Deshaun Watson hasn't shown an ounce of contrition. Don't let anyone frame that narrative. And the defenders, they're out there cheering at team headquarters. It's a sickening display. It's sickening. Well, that's that's the part that is the most grim, is that there are Browns fans and perhaps other people that are rebelling against the Me Too movement or whatever their politics are that viewed a six-game suspension as a victory, right? That, hey, you only got six games. Couldn't have been that bad. And then you read the report, and the report says, this guy's guilty of everything. And so it's merely in the very administrative gray area of what the NFL's personal conduct policy is that this can even be viewed as a win. But it really is gross to watch people flock to him for autographs, people cheer this as a win, and eventually, week seven on Monday Night Football, we'll be cheering him as he runs out onto the field. It's just the height of gross. And I just agree with my dad that there is value in him saying, look, I put people, I made mistakes, I made women feel uncomfortable, I'm going to get help. Like, maybe if they're just words, that's better than what he's doing of, I didn't do anything wrong. It's just, it's yes. bullshit. And it's, there has to be some level of, yes, I, at the very least, I made fe people feel incredibly uncomfortable, and I need to evaluate myself and get help. The reason I buck on this portion of it is because I uh, was surprised a few years ago to hear Jerry Jones say out loud um, that the public wants the misbehaving black athlete to be chastised, to be beaten down, to be humbled. And whoever is cheering for Deshaun Watson these days, whoever those people are, um, I, I believe that if they're still trotting around innocent until proven guilty or he suffered enough or whatever it is that happened in the O.J. Simpson trial where two Americas were looking at something and they were uh, they were bringing in past grievances that had very little to do with what they were witnessing on television. Uh, Deshaun Watson does have his supporters here. Well, if it makes you feel better, I don't just want the black quarterback punished. I, I want the white owners taken to task that shielded their daughter that 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 held up their daughter as the reason the guy that went to a, an unhoused person to find out who he should draft and that person gave him the advice of Johnny Manziel he turned to his daughter here and the daughter said no we're we're, we're good okay let's ask the daughter you just found out he sexually assaulted five five women you you still cool okay we're still gonna go with that Kevin Stefanski Andrew Barry you you argued for the merits of your investigation I want the white head coach taken to task. I want the black GM none of taken the, to task. None of those questions are coming, though, correct? No, they, they've put out their statement. Stefanski spoke to the media. He said that, uh, you know, Deshaun's trying to be his best self, and we stand by the, the ruling of... Uh, of uh, Trying out the bullshit that he yeah. hadn't read the report. Yeah. Now, you, now you've had time to process it. Hammer these folks. Hammer these folks. Maybe that's the only... That's the only punishment. That's the only that, that's the only thing that they have to go through next. They're not going to get grilled like that. That's they not should. But do you think that I I have not seen a press conference that has a lot of that it's in a, it. It's a it's a bullshit public display of uh, of vengeance, but I at least want it. I want people taken to task as directly. Hey, you found out he did this. Do you remember how casually, is it Biscotti, the Ravens owner, when he was on stage after Ray Rice, how he was handling it with grace and charm, right? He was not pressured. He did not feel like the questions were going to be so hard that this was going to be combative. I think he had his legs crossed. I was surprised by how relaxed he was. That This is not the America that that America was. I don't think you'll ever see the press conference that asks sports figures that allows owners to get, man, they can't get, they have all the hard time getting Daniel Snyder in front of Congress. Like right. the idea that these people would sit there for the barrage of questions that would be hostile. The and has, the Haslam zoomed in to the Deshaun Watson press conference. They didn't, they weren't there taking questions, excuse me. And they put it on their daughter. They put it on their daughter. I want to ask the questions with the same ferocity, even more so now that we have the result that says he did this. Now you have to answer for it. Before, we were throwing out hypotheticals, and we were honoring the process. Now you know the sickening truth that he assaulted sexually five women, the cases that were brought forth to the arbiter, knowing that there are mountains more that didn't even make it that far. How do you reconcile that? What do you do now? 
do you lie to me and tell me he's been remorseful? It seems like that's been the play so far, and I really hope they reevaluate that. Because if they came out and were transparent, at least I would give them a little bit. This is transactional. This is not the moralities business. We saw an asset out there. We knew he had this in his past, and we're going to make sure that it never happens again, and we'll move forward together. Everybody deserves a second chance. If you want to lean into that, fine, but do not bullshit me. Do not continue to do that. They would not lean into that. You don't want the truth like that. You can't handle the truth <laughs> like that. Honestly, you but don't. But that is the truth. We're uh, all talking about it openly. No, we but, all know no, it to be so. Yeah, no, but yesterday I asked you guys about what's the point of making money? Is it just to have more money? What I was talking to you about leadership and ownership and how these things change as you're talking about systemic failure. State of Texas law, NFL not equipped. They're trying, not equipped. You're talking about structural stuff falling around these people how do they extract themselves with this situation here with the truth when you're telling me it's all a lie because i was asking you guys yesterday you're okay with it always being about commerce and business because it's never been more obvious that the the bodies don't matter not women's bodies not men's bodies it do, they don't matter it's not the bodies it's keep the machine moving so that it makes money how i'm not even sure how bad this actually is for the nfl in real terms publicity in an off season that's terrible publicity but has us talking about football that will be part of the pregame hype to game 7 monday night football deshaun watson makes his return like this is all part of the grist in the mill that jerry jones calls the circus and enjoys uh, the elements of this that are that are dangerous and american uh the truth you think you're going to get the truth in a pre that any executive would stand up there and say to you, you know what? I need a quarterback for 10 years. I couldn't get this quarterback. Do you know how bad the Browns have been for how long? They just buried our previous regime that we believed in for the first time in 20 years. This guy represents hope. Sorry, some of these dudes are criminals. Some of these dudes do really yeah. bad things, and they're in the huddle anyway. Like, you want the truth? How great would that be? Breath of fresh air. Oh, wow. It honestly would be because we we all know it to be so. I, I did air. His first home game is on Monday Night Football where it'll be a disgusting display of him being showered with cheers. He plays on the road, so the NFL and its broadcast partners get to soft launch this. He'll be at the Ravens, his first game back, wow. in the middle of a slate of a very busy afternoon. I am telling you, once Bill's Rams kicks off on Thursday night, we are all going to fall for it. Wow, We're all going to feel like football is in the air. We're all going to be super excited. We're going to give our Super Bowl picks. We're going to be jacked up about our fantasy teams. And this will go away for a little bit. And maybe it'll enter the conversation again for a brief period before he plays the Ravens. Gone again. And if you didn't know better, you'd think Sue Robinson was looking at the NFL schedule when she decided on only a six-game penalty. Imagine that. We didn't even get to what would be happening right now in South Florida if this was our team. Because Mike is poisoned and sickened and emotional and has been, uh, people are bothered, I would say, by what they would identify as Mike's virtue signaling around this, uh, giving up his fandom because this appalls him so much. And Homer Greg Cody has been cheering Miami Dolphin teams for damn near 50 years. I wonder if any people in Miami listening to this change their opinions on anything we're saying because sports fandom will screw you up that way because you can be an idiot because hell we're talking about 20 years of excitement down here because uh, 20 years of emptiness has been replaced by Tyreek Hill and right. he's got some of this in his past too. Tyreek does. When when Kansas City signed Tyreek Hill, there was a big controversy over his domestic abuse uh incident and uh and the first touchdown pass he was cheered like a hero. And, and so Deshaun Watson will be. And if he played for the Miami Dolphins, it would be the exact same situation. The PR folks for the Miami Dolphins would say, hey, guys, Deshaun's not taking any questions about any of this, just football. And, you know, you're still free to ask it, but then maybe you have your, your credential revoked. Dolphin, Dolphin fans, you got lucky. You got lucky. So did, what, 20 teams reached out to the Houston Texans trying to get this quarterback services? You got lucky. It was a traumatic experience for me as someone that deeply – deeply loved his Cleveland Browns fandom to go to walk away from this team. I saw yesterday as validation 
for that. I was refreshed that it wasn't my problem anymore. You can argue that I'm just as hypocritical for still supporting the league, but I'm telling you, I can't give up football. I love football too much. I can't do it. But you got lucky. You dodged it. You didn't have to ask yourself these deeply personal questions and reevaluate yourself the way that I did. And I'm happy for you. Be excited. Also, Tyreek Hill is in your huddle. Good luck with that. And it was dumb luck. Let's make that clear. Uh, it's, it's unbelievable. It's that they got their way out of this situation by being totally incompetent. <laughs> Imagine McDaniel and Tua is the greatest thing to happen to this franchise. They bungled the uh, the Deshaun Watson thing, and they had Tom Brady and Sean Payton <laughs> right there. We're not for an unprecedented lawsuit from a former head coach. Also, what's happening with that lawsuit? <laughs> keep your eye on the ball did you see most certain times at practice my god i know <laughs> my god pal i have an admission i'd like to make to the group i said something not last week because i was on vacation but the week before uh -huh. and uh i was wrong and what? i think we should all come on here if we if we make mistakes we should admit to them i don't know about that <laughs> really, Roy? You, you Roy just, is speaking for men. Roy, yeah. you're, you're just stubborn. Yeah. Yeah. On behalf, of Roy, on behalf of stubborn defiance. That's right. <laughs> you need to know every one of my secrets. No, underserved part of the community, stubborn men. We should build out that commercial, Roy, on behalf of stubborn defiance. <laughs> yes, we. we should, yes, the idea. That he, go ahead, please continue. As Roy says, no, I will admit nothing. I will apologize for nothing. I will not give you any of my vulnerability. I will hide behind bravado and barbed wire. And kiss my ass, too. There it is. <laughs> you want to walk back that Panthers will win the cup in five years? Take? No. Yeah, stubborn defiance. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I regret nothing. Um, see you with the cup in three years. I'm Roy Bellamy on behalf of stubborn defiance. <laughs> we, you, you need, we need to do that. Uh, you were saying, Chris. I was wrong about not needing TSA pre-check. Oh, wow. And it was like society in the in the world was just like slapping me in the face because right after I did a whole thing about you, I can wait in line with the peasants. It's why you get there early. I had a, I believe my flight was a seven fifteen flight, so it's an early get there. I might have gotten there a little later than I wanted to, but man, was it a zoo! I'm like, that's early in the morning. How much of a zoo is it gonna be? It was a zoo. My wife was crying. She had to like Whoa. cry. We we got there so late that they like wouldn't even take our checked bags. So my wife had to talk to like someone else to get approved. It was a whole thing. Then the security line took forever. We barely made it to the gate, and I was just like the whole time, like if I didn't, if karma, karma is a thing because I just did a whole. I told my wife once we got on the plane. By the way, I did a whole spiel yesterday, and she's just like, "This is your fault." And I was just like, I it couldn't have. It was like a scene from a movie, from what I said on air, and then seeing me in the panic in my wife and myself at the airport the next day. <laughs> you, you, it was comical. You, you, I, I was laughing I was at myself. You, I wish I was there. You, you panicked oh. is funny. You, you. I love that. That happened I was almost doing the thing. I was almost doing the thing where I was like, I need to cut people in security. Like I was gonna do the thing where I got a flight. I got a. Like, I didn't because we just had enough time. I wish but. you would have called me. I, I would have went straight to the airport to watch you do that. I would have went straight to the airport no matter the time. You told me it was early. I would have hauled ass, parked $60 to just sit there and laugh at you in that line. Well, parking was part of the issue that made us late. I had to like park in a different parking lot. That I, had to, I had to hop in a tram. Usually I'm walking right into my thing. Yeah. I'm waiting uh, for a no train. Uber, huh? I have like less wow. than an hour until my flight leaves. Mm -hmm. And I'm sitting at a parking lot waiting for a tram to take me to terminals. I would pay. Wow. I would pay two ninety nine a month to have a GoPro strapped close to your face and another one that shows me what you're viewing. You panicked. It's funnier than anyone else around here. Really? Panicked. It's almost impossible to envision. And yeah, you're the easy go. Well, guy. I was also the one keeping calm because my wife was like losing well, this, this it. Is so what, I was the calm one, but I inside, love that she was inside, okay. she was. This is, she I started crying to this, this person, to you the rest. piece of shit. She's like, you made your have, wife cry. We're going to New Jersey. We have to win this. And they let it. Crying works. Chris, I have. A thousand follow-up questions that I would not need if you, you managed. Subjected your wife to this. If you managed to turn this into content, I'd pay more than two. I've just taken my price up. I'm bidding against myself. If you want to create my ability to see the moment that your wife breaks down, what caused it, what words, what she saw. If you can paint for me a detailed panoramic of how you went from however panicked you were before then to now 
waterworks. Were you expecting them? She's lost faith in you. We're going to fail. I no longer support what this is. It's not going to get us there on time. Take us through the details of how you experienced she bursts into tears. Well, there's initial panic, no tears yet. Once we're in the parking garage and we realize that where we wanted to park is full, so we got to go like two garages over, which is a long walk, so it's quicker to take a shuttle. So we're waiting in line for the shuttle. No tears yet, but she's looking at me like, I told you we should have left at 5.30 and or 5, whatever it was. She said like, we were debating over a half hour of leaving time. And even after that segment I did, I was like, it's early. Let's do a half hour later Mike, than you're saying. why are you enjoying Because it always suffering. starts with the, I told you we should have left yeah. Yeah. Early. I told you let so. Me, let me yeah. ask you a question, sure Chris. went to Uber there, Chris. The pole, what Roy. day did you fly out? It was uh, Friday. You are so lucky that you got to park at a garage at all. Yeah. Because was... there have been times, multiple times now, where I get to the airport and there's just no parking. Yeah. And they say, no parking, figure it out. Yeah. <laughs> what, what? I fly out in 30 minutes. Yeah. How am I supposed yeah. to just yeah. figure this out? Yeah. You are lucky. <laughs> I'm very lucky. Hey, we got on the plane, but the, the tears started. So, so we finally get through security. We get on the tram. We get through the to, finally to our gate. We get to the gate. We're like, all right, maybe it's not a zoo here and we'll be fine. It's a zoo. And there's a long line just to check our bags before we go to security. We're trying to finagle the system. Like, can I just go to the, the, the check bat, like the check line and you go to sit? But they're like, no, we both got to be there to check our bags. We have two separate bags. My, that's and then so the tears happen when we get to the front of the check bag line and we're like, all right, we gotta check our bags. And they're like, what flight are you on? This flight? Sorry, you can't board that flight anymore. Like we're not letting people. In. It's too close to the flight. And my wife just that please get dog like and she just like lost it and then she started talking to somebody and i'm like trying to my grant my daughter's right there i'm like oh, your daughter's there i'm yes. like graceland mommy's <laughs> fine <laughs> evil. i'm like evil. mommy's no. just doing just, her thing okay. she's not up. really upset she's just doing a wow. thing to get us on the plane and then that's like is there i got a stroller there, yeah yeah is there a stroller, oh, a stroller. Is there yes. a stroller? Yes. why is mommy weeping hysterically and, uh, and then it's like we got to ask for a manager and once the manager came over <laughs> we got like he, he he was like you're good we'll get your you your wife asked for the manager perfect and then security line. It was just a stressful, stressful two hours. When we got on, I've never high fived my wife after getting on a plane. We high fived. You guys made it. Uh, that's wife privilege that you guys managed yeah, to get through everything that you got through there. I think most people are missing that flight. The airport is too busy in the morning. It just did. Like to, to Chris's point, when you have an or seven fifteen flight. And you get there, and the airport is packed. Always catches you by surprise. No, but Chris, it's, why did so many no, other people this, this choose is the this worst, life? This it's is awful. the worst time to fly in American yes. history, except for the first few flights when you didn't know if they were going to make it or not. <laughs> like this is, it's terrible time to travel. I'm more interested in why it is that Mike is delighting in every next detail that makes the chaos worse, which is toddler in tow, mommy's crying. Uh, it's insanity. I'm now. the calm face, even though inside I'm like, I did all of this with this segment yesterday. If yeah. it wasn't for this segment, I felt like life was just like, you idiot. We're gonna we're gonna teach you. You're gonna learn today. Yeah. You, and you I did. Yeah, I, right. I got it on the way back. I have TSA you, now. You, yes. Really? Yes. Good for you. <laughs> Wait, so uh, congratulations. Out of your vacation. On the way back, uh, don't have to get me started. On the way back, we ended up having to be in the airport for like six hours because our flight was delayed. So we had a lot of time to kill. And I was like, you know what? Done with it. Doing it. Signing up right now. Mm -hmm. wow. You understand why I'm taking so much joy in this. Because I knew you were this wrong when you were giving that segment. I was sticking up for the peasants. There's a lot of people. For all for as awesome as it is, a lot of people. $5. But uh, but uh, to your point, so why, did, so why isn't everyone doing it? And what happens if everyone does it? Everyone all of a sudden, lazy. the TSA line becomes longer. No. We, you guys right. don't want everyone no, to do it. No, because it's streamlined. It's also streamlined. It goes slower, not just because there's more people in it that are generally lazy. It's not a cost-effective thing. It's, do I want to put in the time? And fill out this paperwork and take make no, an appointment. but it's also the money of family. That I mean, that's hundreds of dollars for. Yeah, but Dan, uh, you can Dan hadn't lines. had you hadn't had TSA pre-check, and it was just abject laziness. The lesson is, you're doing it for that one flight. The lesson is, you're doing you're not doing it for every time. Most of the time, it's not that big a difference. You're doing it for that one time yeah, when times, you're running late. The yeah. one out of every ten flights where you're like, holy shit. That's what you're doing it for. It's, not, it's insurance. It's not It's not that you're running late. It's sometimes days are busier than others. And you fly out of Fort Lauderdale, so I understand your, your very novice approach to all of this. Oh, but the, even if the TSA pre-check line is longer, and I've been there, where I'm like, damn, I should have just went through the regular line. It moves swiftly because people aren't taking their laptops out. People aren't taking their shoes off. Yeah, no belts come off. Yeah. I like, love that you can just pay to like have less security. 
Like it's just like I might Welcome have something life. in my shoes, but I paid ninety five dollars. Well, so I'm this good. Is, this is infuriating, and it's the illusion of safety that we have. And, and in keeping with what we were talking about, the NFL, how we just make up the rules as we go along. I was able to get on a flight with my shoes on without having to take them off, and then a dude tried to hide a bomb in his shoe, and all of a sudden everybody's shoes are off because uh, yeah. the guy couldn't. Uh, after nine no, eleven, no. he couldn't get it. He couldn't get it lit. Only the lazy. Only the lazy have to take their shoes off, Dan. That's why you have to take your shoes off. I haven't taken my shoes off in in decades because of TSA pre-check. You got to get on board with this. And that six hours in the airport, remember another thing that you said, I don't need the Admiral's Club. You do when you get delayed. Good, good, you Admiral. Fool. Yeah. You all, fool. All, all costly, all these things. It is not cheap to be in the Admiral's you Club. You want to know what's costly, Dan? Yeah, you want to know what's costly? Spending seven hours... Yeah. Not of commercial with free a four football, year old. with a four-year-old <laughs> on a very purposefully made uncomfortable oh, chair at an airport so you can't sleep on it because I don't want that And these armrests, like, make them so I can lift them up so I can turn this into a little cot if I need. Nope. nope. It's nope. like it's like the most annoyingly low yeah. little armrests. Why is that happening? Why because is they the... don't want people falling asleep there. Why? But we've got so many seats in an airport. Shouldn't the seats be more comfortable? When I flew through Dubai, they've got entire areas for everybody wow. that are just uh, cots and and normal human conditions right. in an airport. Gold gilded cots over in Dubai. They can actually charge. There are airports that have what are essentially hotel rooms. Really, the answer is they could charge you for it. Yeah, they do because like there are areas like I was when I flew back from MLS Cup from Portland. I had had a bit of a rough night. Uh, the the, the, oh, yeah. the night that I was leaving, Go so on. when I landed, I needed to take a shower when I got back, oh, and yeah. I paid oh. I paid forty dollars to take a shower in the airport. Because, forty dollars? Yeah, no, seriously, like you get a room for an hour, and you can take a shower in that room, <laughs> and that, that that's the reason why I've never it's seen that. Never rather, heard of it. Rather than the hotel, the airport hotel. Yeah. No, not the airport no, hotel. In the airport, just in a room. the airport, like in a terminal. There's an area where there's like there's just a room. That's a room for an hour, and then you get out. It's kind of like that's a gym what. shower, though, right? It's kind of like yeah, someone they, was just they, in they there. They had that at the Admirals yeah. Club. You couldn't pay me to do that. It's good for me. Yeah, at, at 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 upgraded lounges, they have chairs that pull all the way out and showers for your leisure. It's totally worth it. Free free drinks depending on the airliner. The Admirals Club. It depends on the airport. Old thing. I've got a number of questions. Please put it on the poll, please, at Levitard Show. Does it always start with, we should have left earlier? I told you we should have left mm -hmm. earlier. Also, I want to get into the conversation because you guys have talked about showering is such an intimate thing. I, I don't know if anyone else experiences it this way, but I didn't come up through high school showers together or athletic locker rooms and stuff. And so when you tell me that Gardner Minshew was living in a prison bus and going and showering every day in the gym, that seemed unpleasant to me. Now, maybe the Bonita Springs gym is beautiful. And I don't, I don't know why I'm doing that. I'm wondering if I have some repressions here. The idea of me stopping in a in a random airport hotel shower that has been used by Wade Phillips right before me, and I, yeah, <laughs> like I, I, a I, random. And name. you know he's peeing on the floor too. Uh, I just, oh, I, for sure, <laughs> put that on the poll. Is Wade Phillips put it on the poll? Is Wade? Phillips I am too for the record. On the floor of the shower. In the, yeah, we in all the, pee in the in shower. the airport. Stall. I don't understand that too. If you go to the the, <laughs> the showers in the gym, it's never the guys that that are really put together. It's always some dude that looks like Charlie Manuel that comes out of the shower. So, so you're saying you am I the weirdo? So so you wouldn't use like I I understand like the gym bathroom or the gym shower not for me, Clive. But like I, for professional athletes, they presumably are showering in communal areas all the time. This is not new yeah. to them, so they're fine with it. Not for me, but this is like your own personal space. For an hour, you get to imagine I, but it's that not, this but is... Everyone could be using it for 24 <laughs> the hours. I like the previous <laughs> hour was Wade Phillips' hour. <laughs> right. <laughs> Which part are you not understanding? Before that, it was Charlie Manuel, and Charlie Weiss was right behind him. Oh. Ralph Friedgen was back there. How come it's never Jeff Darlington? <laughs> it's never Jeff Darlington. <laughs> It's never Jeff Darlington. <laughs> Same thing with the sauna. Like, comparatively, <laughs> I'm the Jeff Darlington. <laughs> Surrounded by a bunch of Larry Boas. Who's the, who's the one? Is it is is it still Darlington, or is he aged out, replaced by Field Yates? Oh, no, 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 no. It's still Darlington. Zaddy can get it. Do you guys know he has this weird ability to just spin things on his finger? Yeah, I no. saw it on SportsCenter the other day. He was spinning like a 
seat cushion. Yeah. What? Impressed like like you would a basketball. He can any object you hand to Jeff Darlington, he can spit it on his finger. Right. And that's a useless fact that you he will need. He can spit me on his with. finger, I'll tell you that right now. Wow. <laughs> Baby. <laughs> Jesus. Hell yeah. And then escalated Bubba, uncomfortably Bubba. quickly. He's a good looking man. He is. Also, yeah. possibly fillers. I don't know. I'll DM him. I'll ask. Well, let's. Uh, <laughs> Who's your guy? I've got so More many girl. questions here. Did we just do the category that we've never done before, which is person in sports or at ESPN in sports media that you'd most like walking into the shower before you at the airport stall? At least uh, like. Most like or who's most likely to be yeah. stepping out of the shower? Because <laughs> I like Charlie Manuel for this game. I, no, I'm not doing the funny game. I'm not. I want to do the less funny game of what you're describing darling to me, to me as that I know what it is and I'm making it field Yates and I'm asking you, well, who else am I doing on American psycho? A little bit neat, uh, coming in bit gives off polished veneer of business, man. He's not giving off slob. He's not sloppy. He's not, you don't see him unshaven. And if it is, it's five o'clock shadow that looks good on television. He doesn't come in here looking like me and Cody, right? Darlington's always neat. He sleeps in a suit. Is that what we're doing then? Is it neat? Is it somebody who presents well on television Clean. as neat? Really well groomed. Tailored yeah. suits. Really well groomed. Tailored yeah. suits go a very long yes, way. Do. Very long way. Taylor Twelman, if you hang out with him, he doesn't give off that impression, but you see him on TV. Wow, this guy's put together. This guy takes Flawless it seriously. suits. Oh well, how suits. about Shannon Incredible Sharp? Suits. Somebody like Shannon yeah, Sharp. Very tailored suits. Excellent. Yeah. Never worn a tailored suit. Always buy it right off the rack, Jack. Mm. Huge but, surprise. Yeah. You couldn't Never have worn a tailored suit. Development. You couldn't have stunned us more that you didn't have an army of Italian yeah, tailors. I really don't. You want to know what happens to me every time I get a tailored suit? I gain 20 pounds. <laughs> and I can't wear the suit yeah. anymore. And yeah. it's always like the suit's problem. It's never mine. <laughs> Never, tailored suit is a dangerous game in that respect. Oh my god, I have like eight different tailored suits, and I don't fit into any <laughs> what, of them. What's the item of? What's the clothing item that feels the shittiest when you've outgrown it? Jeans. The wedding pants. I'm, the wedding I'm, pants. I'm going with a dress shirt. Yeah, like a dress shirt. Yeah, that yeah, two yeah, years ago you yeah, wore to a wedding yeah, yeah. and you put it on and you're like, nope, it's not happening. Upstairs. When when you start yeah. having the skin oh, peek yeah. through a little when bit. You lift yeah. your oh arms yeah, the skin, that, the, the skin, skin peek. Oh, the skin, the skin peek oh, through. Is oh awful. no, oh, no. But I'm telling you, it's the pants. Tire, because yeah. Very often you don't have another option. You're like, but the pants you can fake. I can fake it through the pants because you just got to suck in the gut tight. And once you get it buttoned, I don't think you're experiencing any of this. I am actually. I think you're going along with the crowd here. I believe you've been the same shape the entire time that I've known you. For 20 years, my guess is that you fit into all the same clothes you've always fit into. No, not really. Uh, I've, I've gained weight. I feel like he's put on like five pounds since he's been a dad. Let me see your belly. He's been eating Doritos. He's been eating Doritos for 20 years. 185 pounds now. 185? Flash yeah, me. Yeah, wow. That's the lightest I've ever been. Flash me your belly. Come on, stand up, Roy. Come on, stand up, Roy. No. Come on, Roy. Roy, what is the what is the dress shirt? Is it the suit? What is it? The, the wedding suit? What are you saying? Because this is, you are not uncomfortable comfortable gaining five pounds in your clothes well it wasn't five pounds it was 15 i was wow. 170 so i'm at 185 now yeah, and i got the tub huh? going i got the tub may, may i i'm gonna make the argument that you were malnourished prior to i think that this is your playing weight yeah. wow. you look great no, no, no! I'm you fat. Do. This is not muscle. Bro, you're not. I'm you're not. Fat. You're not fat. I'm fat right now. Let me see now. your belly Look left. No, I'm not. I'm not gonna. Quit, quit tucking the question. Let me Roy see your Bellamy, belly. on behalf <laughs> of stubborn defiance, uh, the the thing that I want uh, to continue with you though, Chris, is because you've now trotted in the chaos X factor variable of a toddler. You were agreeing with Billy's take last week that the vacation experience is totally different now when you bring kids with you. And it seemed like both of you were lamenting it, that it's not, it's such a joyous thing to raise a child who is a symbol for the love I have for my wife who I just made cry in the airport. Look, <laughs> life is about pros and cons, okay? And vacations before kids was all pro, right? You go on vacation, there's very few cons on a vacation, right? It's like... It's you're eating good. You can sleep as long as you want. You get to make plans. You're drinking. You're at beach. It's there's all pros. Very little cons. The only con is like the last night of vacation. And I have to leave tomorrow. When you have a kid, look, they wake up early. They don't want to do things. There's some. There's more cons added into vacations 
when you have a kid. And I'm not like the good stuff is still great. Like watching my daughter do things. But is the good stuff better? Is which is the better vacation? Because it's not it's as relaxing. Vacation with kids, not exactly relaxing. I'm trying to walk a line here because I love my daughter and I don't want to be that guy. But it's just, yeah, it's just a different experience going on a vacation with kids. Sure. Parenting don't stop. And it's, uh, yeah, it's it's a lot. But I love my daughter. Love you, Grayson. Mike Ryan is... Oh, dude, I am just thirsting all over these studio <laughs> hosts right now. I was looking at photos of Adam Zucker, who you may remember from CBS's <laughs> SEC coverage. My God, pal. <laughs> <laughs> you're you're doing a sideline beefcake now evan washburn you can Whoa. get it well go ahead and put together the list let's see how many we've got here if we're talking tailored suits we're talking what is the it, category uh, it's is it top five studio zaddies okay I, I, would, quick. I would go studio hosts that are kempt well kempt i prefer my way mm. mike tannenbaum right. i'm i'm mike ryan <laughs> on behalf of <laughs> stubborn defiance we're doing it my way <laughs> I still don't know what the category is, though. Is it person most like You'll Jeff Darlington who will walk into the airport shower beforehand and you're good with it? Because it's not Mark Mangino. Oh, God. <laughs> Who's Adam it? Zucker is we, we good gotta, I, I see what we're doing right now with the guys coming out of the shower, and I don't like it one bit because they're all heavy set. Let's find let's find a really thin one. Did I tell you that I uh, I rejected that People Magazine shoot uh, sexiest bachelor or whatever it was? No, I'm sorry, eligible bachelor was not sexiest bachelor. They wanted me coming out of the shower. I refused. Good call, I would <laughs> yeah. say. So it's, yeah. The internet thanks you for that. Yes. Instead, I was squatting on a pool table. <laughs> Better not situation. Not embarrassing. No. Dana Holgerson would be coming out of the, oh, uh, the gym no. shower. What about Trey <laughs> Wingo? <laughs> Paul Feinbaum. Yeah. Feinbaum would too. It's never Ryan Smith. <laughs> Shit, I may have given away my number one. Oh, man. I think I did. <laughs> the late Jerry Tarkanian is somebody visually. The shark. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Where are we? Top five zaddies who uh, you'd like or you'd prefer be the people Entering the airport shower that you're renting for forty dollars, number five. Wow. I, okay, you did not give me any time, but it's okay. I can do this from the top of my head. <laughs> Here we go. Number five is Adam Zucker. <laughs> is it all sports media personalities? Yeah, studio zaddies. Ooh, wait. Can I do this on news? The reason if I I'm, can do this on news coverage. I know who you're going to pick. Well, I can't do Chris Cuomo anymore. Uh, no, but that's no. not. Yeah. It's the sixty minutes guy, Pelly. Scott Pelly. Yeah. yeah. Scott Guys, stop yes. doing it. Anderson looks, Cooper. He looks <laughs> good in a yeah, he looks good in a Anderson suit. Anderson Cooper, wow. Good one. Who's uh who's that dude from David? Flawlessly white hair, Anderson Cooper. Yeah. I, I think he has the whitest hair on television. The Love it. The problem with studio uh I mean I mean, might be too much of a stickler here on Studio Zaddies, but Darlington is technically not he's a he's a roving reporter. He's not and uh and and Zucker is a is not a studio person, is he? Yeah, he's he's Zucker the host is. of uh, the SEC on CBS. All right. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. All right. So there's great gonna voice. be a great, great, great set of pipes as there's well. There's gonna be some legacy to legacy top five, top five guys here too. Okay. Because we gotta <laughs> we gotta tip our hats to the guys that made the game. Now this is all going to change, right? Because I do want to get into this story that broke yesterday that uh, Amazon in making a bunch of alternate feeds on NFL games on Thursday night have hired Dude Perfect because they're going to have a lot of alternate programming. They're going to test stuff. Like, the day has arrived that I've wanted forever. Some of this stuff is going to be swing and miss, but Amazon has all the money in the world, and they'll just put together combinations and see if they can figure out a, a secondary viewing experience that doesn't just have to be the broadcast. So I don't know how far afield you're going to go here in sports, just people who look good in suits. Uh, OLI, Tim Tebow. Oh, yeah. Ooh. He looks great in his suit. This is the tailored suit thing. It's it's hugely important. He really can fill it out. And he also gets a haircut on the reg every week. He's a, he's a handsome man. He's got it going on. He's figured it out. I'm a big fan. I gave you Adam Zucker Winner for life. He just keeps winning. Yeah, he does. Uh, let's also go OLI, David Muir, ABC News. Oh, wow. Oh, wow, you're going great, all of, you're great, going. Great lettuce. All yeah, also media. dyes it, but it's all right. In our ever-going war, in our ever-present war against aging, David Muir is at the forefront. Fake tan. As it relates to Tebow in a suit, Mike, 
winner forever? Yeah, always, always. Is he doing any anti-aging things or is he doing it natural where he is aging beautifully without, he is fighting off age because he always wins? His forehead is very smooth. But I got to see him. It's been a couple of months. No accusations from you yet? No, that no, he's, he's still a very young man. So no, nothing there just yet. Uh, dude, how do you get your triceps that big? They tell you it's all about form, that you could actually build your triceps up with a tomato can. Did you know that? Oh, again with this nonsense. <laughs> I've been doing Yes, dicks. a tomato can filled with pepperoni assholes. Yep. <laughs> What'd you call me? <laughs> <laughs> Number three, Ryan Smith. Come on now. You can't have this list without him. I know. And you want to talk about a guy that gets a haircut every week. That that guy might get a haircut every three days. That's, That's every a disqualifier. Yeah. <laughs> Weekly haircut disqualifier. Yeah. yeah. Shout out to OLI Ryan Clark from like five years ago where he had like that mohawk going. My God, Pa. Number two. We've got to tip our hat to the OG, Kirk Herbstreet. Yeah. Prior to Kirk Herbstreet, I didn't know a studio host could be handsome. Had to be done. Yeah. An analyst handsome? No way. They all look like Lynn Pascarelli. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Number one, Jesse Palmer. Oh, yeah. oh wow. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No Chris Fowler, huh? No Chris Fowler. Oh, wow. Fowler. Chris Cotter, OLI? Oh, OLI, Chris Cotter. Nate Burleson? He's very good, too. There's so many zaddies out there. Herb Street is... Herbie. Fighting off aging as well i'm not sure he fills out the suits like that anymore i'm not one to talk obviously i'm not body shaming kirk herb street but is he still a zaddy or yeah, is he, he one of the original are you just uh, giving him a uh, coordinating him original a, zaddy yeah. uh, and he still he still can get it man and you want to know something about their suits they don't look as finely tailored because they have air conditioning in their suits yeah. their suits are That's bulkier right. because they have these high-tech suits that have fans in them what yeah, yeah. Seriously? Yeah, you. Th I didn't know there was such Herbie. a thing. I thought it's just Herbie. No, no, no. That does they that. all no, have. They all that. do it. They all have that. Oh, that's crazy. They all have that. I've gone BTS the at College the Game to. Day. Yeah. <laughs> you think they did that show from Coral Cables with non AC suits? You idiot. Sorry, that was mean. I don't know why that escalated to that. <laughs> because uh, he just got TSA pre-check. You idiot. Yeah. <laughs> there, there are plenty of people in our audience right now who do know how to take care of themselves and do know how to have a shirt not tighten. Yeah, but they go to the gym like five days yeah. a week. We can't do that. I want to look great and not put in any of the work. Me too. Yeah, like me. Welcome yes. to the club. <laughs> the Stugats, wait, like they work out in a can? You can just show up Look, and purchase. I'm, already, I'm, I'm doing a fair amount of work. I'm eating one a real meal once a day yeah. on weekdays. Uh, Weekend, I treat myself a little bit, a little IF. Aren't you feeling the fast. ravages of 30, though, where it's not as easy to lose the weight when you go to the gym for three weeks? Yeah. Yeah, I'm very frustrated. I used to lose weight like that. Now it's an effort that's being put in. And I'm not crazy about the effort. I'll put effort into my work. I can't do the effort for play. No, no, no. For play, that should come easy. It always has. What happened with- I don't like running. Is it the pictures of the of the video from the golf tournament? Did you not like how you looked after well, not having any carbs before the golf tournament? Like, what is, what is the source of returning with slim fasts and dying the mustache? Well, the, <laughs> the internet is very the mean. The internet is very mean. But let me tell you, first and foremost, the culprit here is my own personal vanity. I'm a very vain individual. I grew up as a model. How can you not be? It's a very vain industry. You wanted to be in Menudo, right? You tried out. I tried out for Menudo. You ah. know what that does to a kid's psyche? I got body dysmorphia now. It's just because I was trying out in auditions. Everyone telling you you're handsome, and compared to you, guys, not handsome my enough. God. Not handsome wow. enough. Failed you, Menudo you, applicant. You are, uh, no. do you know and honestly, you Tony comes along, and my my standing within the show's handsome meters takes a hit a little bit because he comes young yeah. and he's vibrant. Oh, he's yeah. got a nice body. He can lose 15 pounds at a time. You see this guy? It's ridiculous. So the young bucks are coming for my stuff. I'm not letting go of this mantle of <laughs> most handsome guy on an ugly sports radio show anytime soon. You want it? You're going to have to Are rip you, it out of my cold, dead hands. You, you might have been a applicant for this position that we're giving out of not in a good, not good in a suit, but guy that it'd be okay because he takes care of his hygiene before going and, and using an airplane shower. Right. By comparison, you guys made me look like 1997 George Clooney, but now I'm getting up there. 
Now I got to put in the work. But I'm not going. <laughs> you don't want to. No, I'm just going to spackle know. my forehead with filler. <laughs> I'm going to dye my beard. I'm going to do keeps. Thankfully for the results. If not, I'd be on the first plane out to Istanbul, and we'll see where this goes. If you, like, this is bad at 36. Can you imagine what a monster I'm going to be at 40? I'm going to do stem cells live on the air. <laughs> I may How just, does one do stem cells? I'm gonna yeah, I'm gonna I'm find a done. beef jerky umbilical cord <laughs> and I'm gonna chew it for an entire show. Whatever I can do to pull off whatever Tom Brady, just an ounce of what Tom He's Brady is doing done. it right because he is eight years older than you, and Tom Brady has a fountain of youth in a way that is con- totally inexplicable. And and science is helpful, but he looks it, it the face is feeling some of the tightening and the stretching, but he really takes care of himself in a way that is maniacal. Well, the on-field success is totally inexplicable. The face you can explain. Yeah. The hair you certainly can explain. He's had a hair transplant. He's obviously dying the hair. It's ridiculous. At that golf tournament, you saw that his hair is actually a natural shade of white at the roots. So you know what he's doing. He's obviously doing filler. His white. face has changed. Yeah, he's got white hair in the back. You, you got to watch it, man. He, he's been... <laughs> These people that have been dyeing their hair for 25 years, they're the most dangerous. Yes, white hair. Because you don't notice it happening. Brady looks like Anderson Cooper in real life. You're telling me that Tom Brady, if he were not dyeing his hair, he would look like Anderson Cooper? Yes. You're telling me hit the pressure and the stress of that job instead of looking graceful champion icon who's going to age smoothly into a great job in retirement, never aging on television. You're telling me hair totally white like Albert Einstein. Yes, totally white like Albert Einstein. Yeah. See, people were making fun of Joe Buck having his 10th hair transplant. And I don't know if you saw the the photo of Troy Aikman <laughs> with his eyes like, br- like bright red out in 100 degree heat trying to train for the pressures of television, because that's what it is. These are very vain people in the TV industry. Troy Aikman and Joe Buck, they used to be the young guys. Now people are coming for their stuff. What do they do? They hit the lab. Let's talk about that photo of Troy Aikman. His, he was working very hard. If you have not seen Troy Aikman recently, he has a six pack. When he's on a boat as the most handsome person among ugly people like Great Mike Bryant with Terry Bradshaw and Jimmy Johnson and Tony Wise. He he has discovered some of the secrets that I have dipped into over the years. Go into the 90s Cowboys reunion as Troy Aikman. You'll come out with a major ego boost. There's no Anthony Collati you'd hopping on that boat anytime soon. They're only getting older. But he gets to 50 years old. Aikman's just about 50, is he not? And the workout that he was doing... Uh, bare-chested in the Texas heat, his eyes were werewolf red. Yeah. And I think it was just a byproduct of the heat. I think he was physically melting there. I mean, good for him. He wants to put in the work. I'd rather do lunchtime lipo and not do any of that. Running and sweating, just not my thing. It's not. Do you like it? Do you like running and sweating? <laughs> Who likes running and sweating here? Well, wait a minute. No, no, but, but, but it's the no, point. I like no, the results. Don't don't like no, 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 no. I like the results. Don't do this. I like the results. This show came out against cycling and running, and now this sports show is going to come out of against exertion. Yes. Yeah. Damn. Physical fitness overrated. <laughs> mm-hmm. Look, there are people in life who like running. They are ahead of the game. They don't like they, it. No, they do. Yeah, they, they do. Like they're they're people, they're people they're the people the people the people the like If we did a poll of Americans and asked, do you like running? No, come on, It would be, I would say, Say less than 15% like it. Running sucks. Right. Run- it, it sucks. But you know what? It's a fundamental part of life. That you ha- Sometimes there are things in life that you do them even though you don't want to. It's unnatural. And running is absolutely one of them. You could bike ride. No, we've evolved. What do you I don't, mean? I don't it's run unnatural. unless somebody's chasing running me. Running is natural. No, no, no. It was natural when we were running away from woolly mammoths and saber-toothed tigers. Correct. Now we can just hop on a scooter. We don't need to run anymore. Running is not unnatural. Yes, it is. It is. It yes, really it is. is. The only yeah. time I run is when I'm shoplifting. If it were so natural, why does it... <laughs> if it were... You have been useless this segment. <laughs> wow. Jesus. <laughs> why does it hurt me? Why does running hurt me the older that I get if it were so natural? Why do, why do I have to have planted... Like, I have specially designed <laughs> insoles, Dan. That's how washed I am. Uh, Mike, I will not. I got plantar fasciitis. Oh you know how God. I got him? Just standing watching a concert one day. I was like, ah! Can we make these uh, these commercials, please, where Roy is coming to us on behalf of Stubborn Defiance, and now you guys put me in the position where I, as advocate for this show, Dan Lebetard, on behalf of running. 
because physically it'd be stupid for me to say that I like running. It is, uh, I, it is an ordeal. How this, often do you run? This uh, I uh, just with my trainer occasionally, but my body parts I need to keep them pristine and flexible. And the the goal at this point is no pain. Is just don't be in pain. So don't do too much sprinting. You're doing that example. pliability stuff. Yes, that's but, what Tom Brady does. You know that. Uh, it's been very healing and very healthy for me. It makes me feel okay. But when I come to you on behalf of running, I will say having talked to people who do love running or are addicted to running, that you are leaving out a large portion of the audience when you say, on behalf of exertion, not for me, I don't no, want it. No, don't want any part of it. I want the results. And this is a results business. What I mean by that is television. I don't see Jesse Palmer in the gym. I just see Jesse Palmer. You see him in a furniture commercial. Yeah, yeah, because he looks great. He's a zaddy. Running is an outdated thing. Yeah. We really don't need is. to run to get skinny. We have doctors for that, Dan. It's an addiction. Yes. Illness. Yes. So is lunchtime life. Like lipo. a religion. This is a preposterous take. No, it isn't. Run is running is outdated. It is. And, we are, we and are and on unnatural. a sports it's show. Bad the for whole the knees. thing. No. The whole thing is predicated <laughs> I, I upon can't running. What I'm listening we're not to. talking about running. Wait, wait, we're hockey. soccer running. We're talking about long distance running. We're talking about like deciding no, I'm going to leave my house. Any kind of exertion. Uh, I'm embarrassed. By I don't the like last... to soft jog across the street. Oh, I thought we were talking about long distance. Jaywalking. I don't know. Running. Running's for the birds. Right. Even the birds don't they, run. Birds don't Even run. the birds yeah, don't they run. Walk. Yeah, they walk. Except ostriches. They don't ostriches, walk. Ostriches, uh, they, they, they run. They fly. Emus. And Run, running's like, oh, there's a bear that's going to get me. Penguins. And even then you shouldn't run. You shouldn't Ron run. McGill, you should yeah. say, hey, bear. <laughs> no, it's, a, it's a throwback to colonial times, which right. actually gets me thinking, how many times would you have died in colonial times? If, if you lived your life, <laughs> but simply in colonial times... How many times oh. would you have been dead? Because I've done the inventory. I would have died at least three times in colonial times. Yeah. Take a musket ball right to the gut. Now, I'm not even talking about like the violence and the fact that I'm I'm considered by many to be brown. Dysentery. You're North talking yeah. about dysentery. Yeah, yeah, but no, I've had diverticulitis one time. I had pneumonia one time. I would have been gone by before the age of 27. I saw a stand-up comedian doing a bit on if he went if if, if he time traveled back to 1920 right now. And everyone, he'd have all this information of like technology, how it's going to be, but he wouldn't have any ability to like help people get there. Like imagine me being thrown <laughs> in the 1920s. It's like, we're going to have, yeah. like, we're going to have iPhones. It's like, all right, let's do it. I'm like, I don't fucking know how to yeah. do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the idea guy. So where's, where's Graham Bell? I'm just the idea guy. You guys figure it out. I'm telling you, we it's need, possible, we need one of the, We need, it's a, like a black square. <laughs> it's no, I'm not going to travel back to the 1920s. No, not it's my black ass. Better. Sorry. No, it's never better. It's not for everyone. It's, it's not, not for everybody. No, it's always worse for everybody except for Chris Cody, who's greatest worry would be wait a minute i'm supposed to be a hero i can tell these people about the iphone guys an air fryer <laughs> all right let's do it shit amin el hassan has bombed in with us ron mcgill is here to save the animal kingdom if you want to be a giver this is an easy place to do it because ron mcgill's work is pure on behalf of the animals we've got questions as we always do around here for the Animal King, we learn something every week. Also, Chris Whittingham wants to read a letter that defends Greg Cody, and Chris Cody wants to play music that he believes the audience will find funny, but that will make his father weep with joyous narcissism. So we will get to that song in a moment. But first, uh, Ron McGill, on behalf of the animals, Amin Al Hassan has something for you to start us off. Ron? Uh oh. Ron, you've often said that, you know, if you encounter a bear, you want to make yourself big and say, hey, bear, hey, bear, right? I most of the time. Yes. Uh, so most of the time is the key part because I read that uh, that won't work with polar bears. So what do you do if you encounter a polar bear? Say your last prayers. <laughs> You're just fucked. <laughs> wow. Just that's it. There's wow. no so a polar bear is eating and that's it. You run, whatever, it's climbing up a tree, or you've got no chance. There's no way that just a weapon helps you. You can't you're no, not gonna win. Really, you really, really a polar bear is truly the only carnivorous bear, truly carnivorous bear, that eats basically meat. And anybody will tell you that it is by far the most dangerous bear. Um, you know, you could scream and holler all you want. There's no chance of running away. It'll catch you. Um 
you know, I, I don't know what else to tell you, but uh, generally speaking, the odds are very much against you with a polar bear. Wow. When you get saddened by climate change's ravages, Ron, where does the emaciated polar bear rank, uh, just making you sad having to witness it? Well, you know, it's obviously the, the poster animal for climate change, right? The, they're not able to go out on the ice. But I'll tell you what, I don't think polar bears are going to become extinct. I think what polar bears are probably going to do is they're going to adapt. I think they're going to, instead of saying, listen, I'm really hungry. I can't get out on the ice. I got to look for food elsewhere. They're going to be coming inland. They're going to start challenging things like Kodiak bears for things like elk and some of the big land mammals. And I wouldn't be surprised if you start seeing significant crossbreeding between things like polar bears and Kodiak bears. Um, I think these animals are going to adapt. Yes, I think their numbers will be significantly reduced. I think a, a great number of them will suffer and starve, but I think there will be a certain number of them that will adapt uh, to this climate change, so to speak. If they can't get out on the ice and get seals, they're going to find something else. I mean, at the end of the day, a big elk, a big moose will provide them with the protein they need, maybe not the fat they need in the, in the, in the ratio that they need it, but I think there's going to be an adaptation there. Again, this is not to say, oh, don't worry about it. It's still a horrible situation. But I am very, very hesitant to think polar bears are going to become extinct rather than just adapting and challenging the Kodiak bears on the land. What is the uh, the hybrid called bet uh, between a, a polar bear and a Kodiak bear? Because I know between a, a polar bear and a grizzly, they call them pizzlies. No, no, growlers. Goliak. They're growlers, not <laughs> pizzlies. What are you talking about? No, pizzly is no. A, a real thing. I know. Growler is what it's called. No, this is Look a tomato, tomato thing. No, no, well, no. Why don't we just ask Ron? No. Yeah, yeah. Let's no. fight. They come, up, they come up with different types of names. For instance, like a lion and tiger, one is called a tie-on. The other one's called a liger. The tie-on is when the, the male is the tiger and the female is the lion. And the liger is when the uh, male is a whatever backwards the other way around so they switch them around that way depending on which one's the female which one's the male i've got follow-up questions on your uh, evolution here the kodiak bear polar bear fight what's how's that one going well you know the kodiak bear is the largest of the land bears uh and some will say the kodiak bear actually gets larger than the, the polar bear i i think it's a 50 50 buddy unless of course it's in the water the polar bear is probably going to have an advantage but I, I'm going to go with a 50-50. I mean, a huge Kodiak has certainly has the ability to take out a polar bear. That's going to be one of the things where it's, you know, Fraser Ali. And what kind of spawn monster are you having coming for human heads in the evolution of the Kodiak bear <laughs> and the and the polar bear? Because now you're creating a an even stronger version of a hunting animal, are you not? Of, of a predator. Yeah, but you know what, Dan? Unfortunately, none of those predators can outrun a gun. So as long as, as humans are out there with the big guns, they'll always have the advantage, unfortunately. Ron, you are setting up... <laughs> unfortunately. Ron, you are setting up a fight card for pay-per-view in the Animal Kingdom. It's three fights. You have an opener, a middle fight, yeah. and a headliner. What are the three fights? Wow. That's a good one, huh? Well, I, I mean, I guess you're going to have to go with a um, let me help you out here though ron just a little bit in that the opening fight uh, people are just trickling in you don't want right, to give, it. It. You don't uh, give away the goods are we here. doing weight classes I, I, I do watch a little bit of sports and no we're not doing weight classes because then you gotta, <laughs> no don't complicate my life here well, the, heavy, the heavyweights <laughs> can't be fighting okay. on the undercard okay, okay, the flyweights okay. are the best yeah, well, fights they're shitty high heavyweights they can ron did you just feel patronized by dan yeah yeah like a little bit a little bit um so here we go on the opening I'm going to go. I'm going to go with a badger and a wolverine. All right, That's there we go. Oh, yeah. Yeah, all right, we got our flyweight. Yeah, we got not our bad. flyweight. That's not flyweight. bad. How long? That's how did that good. fight go? Yeah. Noisy that fight. Flight, Noisy. That, 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 that fight. That fight's going to be a toss-up. I'm not giving a fight where the obvious odds. I'm giving a fight that you're going to have to watch the whole damn fight. It's not going to go down in one round. This one's going okay. to the judges. This is probably going to the judges. I'm thinking this may go to the judges. Badger and a Wolverine. Number two. And wait, oh, uh, wait before you go. Before you go to number two, uh, number number three is going to be horrible to watch. Correct. Nobody's going to actually want to watch that fight. Uh, the, the, those fighting animals. Want to be. But it, it depends. It depends, Dan. Listen, I think half of those UFC fights are horrible to watch. These guys are pulverizing, blood spattering everywhere, noses on one side of the face. It's just horrific stuff, man. So that, it depends on what kind of person you are. Some people thrive on that stuff. There are people who are looking for the train wreck. Those people are going to love the Badger and the Wolverine. It's just going to be... <laughs> it's going to be horrific. Okay? So, next. Number two. Tiger and a Lion. Oh, the Ooh. classic. 
Classic. Wow. <laughs> What's our main event? <laughs> wow. <laughs> I'll tell you, the main event is going to be a toss-up, man. I would go with the Kodiak and the polar bear or the great white shark and the killer whale. Ooh. Oh, good luck getting them in a ring. Going. That one's going well under. Those are super heavyweights. That's not seeing round two. You haven't seen the Shark Week footage, the drone footage of the killer whales? They'll just eat the liver within 30 no, no, no. seconds. Yeah, but that's the killer whales. One-on-one, -on -one, it's a different story. Uh -huh. Okay, one-on-one, -on -one, it's a different story. Tell us more. Tell us more, Ron. How does the fight in the epic heavyweight division here as Shark Week? Uh, we just celebrated Shark Week. Uh, you're telling me the Great White has a chance one-on-one. -on -one. I, I am absolutely telling you a Great White has a chance one-on-one. -on -one, okay? Um, not as uh, See, Mike's shaking his head because he, he doesn't want to believe. But I'm telling you, guys, it's like, you know, if he gets the first punch in, gets the first bite, causes incredible bleeding, mm. uh, He's just as fast as going to be the killer whale. So you're giving the, the great white. You're giving the great white the puncher's chance. I'm giving him the puncher's chance. If he gets that first shot in there, that bam, it's over. Is, is he okay. a big underdog though? Is there because he is a bit of an underdog. There's no question the great white is a bit of an underdog. But depending on the odds, I might put my money on it. Could be a big payout. Okay, because I think the, the great white has a chance. And listen, while we're on this Shark Week stuff, I've been you know I've been doing so many interviews about sharks and shark attacks and all this stuff happening in the Northeast. Let me give you guys some stats so you put things in perspective. Okay, mm -hmm. there are over 400 species of shark in the world. Over 80 percent of those species never get longer than four feet long. Keep that in mind. Okay, last year nine people died from shark attack in the entire planet. Nine people last year. Last year, a hundred million sharks were killed by people. Okay, let's keep this all in perspective. Scoreboard. We just did a podcast, though, that is available now with uh, with the director of a podcast called Reunion, where the bull sharks were attacking with fatal rates that no one's ever seen. And it seems like the bull shark is angry. Is it possible that uh, that climate differences might be creating ecosystem changes that would make some animals more aggressive than they have been in places where surfers uh, numerically where surfers uh, used to feel safer? Well, Dan, I'll tell you what's happening, at least with the white sharks up in the Northeast. Yes, the water is getting warmer. These sharks are coming more inland. But more importantly, and the thing you have to keep in mind is it's also creating a population explosion of seals and sea lions, which is the white sharks favorite food. And when these guys are going in, if you guys ever been up to a beach in the Northeast, it's not like going to a beach here in Florida. You've got these beautiful crystal clear waters. you got murky water. It's cold. It's got seaweed and crap all over the place. These sharks are basically biting out of mistaken identity. You got a surfer in a wetsuit on a board. It can be easily mistaken for a seal or sea lion. These sharks will bite. And more often than not, they let it go. Trust me, Dan. If a white shark wanted to eat a surfer, he'd eat the surfer. And you wouldn't get a surfer walking out of that ocean. It was bull sharks, yeah, well, though. That, that happens, so. It happens, and the, and the sharks get really territorial. It, it's a case-by-case -case basis with these sharks. Sometimes they appear like they really like the human flesh because they finished the whole thing. It's a case-by-case -case basis, Mike, but the overwhelming majority of them, you can always point out that one oddity where there is an actual death. Again, Mike, nine people died last year. Nine! Nine! I will not have this strong defense of sharks. We need somebody to come out and come against these monsters because I know every single last one of you. If you see a, a fin in that water, you're getting the hell out, including Ron McGill. No, not Ron. No, Ron. No, I, Ron, I, I, you I see, swam with them. I've got pictures swimming yeah. with them. Yeah, yeah. You see a bull shark fin. You see a tiger shark uh -huh. fin. You see a great white shark fin. Hey, Your ass is you. certainly out there on the dry land. Well, uh, Mike, you're right. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna push my luck. Oh, I'm not uh, afraid of a dogfish, Ron. I'm afraid of these monsters of the ocean. Dinosaurs of the sea. Yeah. <laughs> You done now, Mike? Yeah. Ron, speaking of sharks, uh, yeah. can you talk about the Greenland shark? Uh, I read that they Greenland can live. shark, the yeah. oldest vertebrate on the face of the planet, man, can grow to be, can live to be over 300 years old. What a phenomenal animal when you think about that. Ron, I have a follow up question to uh, the shark debate. Um, polar bears are amphibious, I assume, right? Well, they are certainly uh, the most aquatic of the bears. Yes. Okay, is is there any circumstance where a polar bear? I can answer your question, Greg. No, no. <laughs> is there any amphibian? Is there any circumstance where a polar bear versus a shark would actually be an interesting fight? Uh not in the water. What if the polar bear just jumped on, <laughs> like did a, like a land, flying either. elbow, <laughs> like a flying elbow from a big piece of ice into the water? Ah, it's, right on the it's shark. It's not yeah. good in the water. That's what I'm it's thinking. It's not good on land. But the flying either. elbow, like this, Ron. Ah, ah. 
Is this, is this back to the night? Yeah, I was doing a thing. Yeah. Yeah. So like, what, the polar bear can go for the eyes, though. Yep. Like Hello, Cool like, J did. Can like fake Rick a heart attack fake and an eye gouge. Dirty players, polar bears. <laughs> <laughs> like Rick Flair uh, winning him. What do you have for yeah, Ron McGill? Like Ron, I, I went down the beach this weekend, and there was an enormous amount of seaweed. And I did some reading on it, and it turns out there is a massive amount of nitrogen in the air as a result of deforestation. And I guess my question would be, what are the minor minor inconveniences of climate change? Yeah, we talk about the notion of our homes flooding here in Miami, but what are the minor inconveniences that will come as a result of climate change? A lot more mosquitoes due to rain and due to more habitat for these mosquitoes to breed. And that's the inconvenience that you get bit by mosquitoes. The major inconvenience is a lot of those bites can transfer things like dengue and uh, a wide variety of other diseases that can be fatal. So, um, you know, you're, you're getting this influx of insects can be a real pain in the butt. Um, of course, it's it's humidity, heat and humidity. I mean, how much of us are enjoying being out in the afternoon here in South Florida now? It's just like you can't really enjoy the outdoors uh, like we could have maybe 30 years ago. Um, you know, those are what I call inconveniences, but they all lead to to major problems. Another dreary note uh, to <laughs> end uh, this lovely segment in, that many people have loved for years. Very popular. Listen to it with the uh, with the kids. The world is ending. Uh, the mosquitoes are coming. The polar bears are going to fight the the Kodiak bears and create a species of monster that will make get more. <laughs> guns in the world thank you ron we appreciate thank it thank you thank you very much sharks are good mark uh, mike no that's no, not right not. that's not. not sharks are not they're good not. don't, don't, are boost, not good. Good. don't boost your don't boost your metrics with not a nerd shark you too. brother they're not when you good. start having to pay a ton of money for seafood because there's not good seafood available to eat because the sharks aren't keeping the population strong and healthy come back and talk to me jokes then, on you right. i also pay a lot right now for seafood <laughs> way too much enough. when you got no sharks you're gonna be out of your price range brother you're gonna have to get another gig Bullshit, I have no price range when it comes to sushi. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, guys. See you later, Ron. Uh, let's go to the music that Chris Cody says that he has that uh, requires some setup. Greg Cody joins us every week here as part of uh, his promotion for the Greg Cody podcast featuring Greg Cody. Greg Cody show with Greg Cody. Thank you. So a few months back, we did a bit where my dad talks about his Pebble Drive. It turned into Bruce Springsteen. Mike was doing his Bruce Pebble Drive down uh, a pebble. I was born on a pebble zone drive. And it inspired our Yeti Blanc <laughs> from the Greg Cody Show podcast. He wrote a song. He's ours. And uh, yeah, this song, and it's kind of like a funny song, but it's it's got some heart to it. Well, but it's but got some heart. Did, did your father uh, he, cry? You got to listen to the podcast, but there it was genuinely emotional, and it was actually like I, I love to I love to make fun of my dad on the podcast. It was it was a moment that I even had to step back and be like, wow, this is kind of cool that my dad was moved by this. Nice. And was he moved by it because the song was beautiful, or he just loves anyone <laughs> singing his name? <laughs> you can't out. be both. <laughs> <laughs> To the test of time The scent of Villa Rose flows through The floor to pine Gary the bag was a friend of mine The wall at 1440's to the test of time You never know
a little long. <laughs> that wasn't the whole thing. <laughs> yeah, how happy is Yeti right uh, now? It's a proper single. <laughs> they don't make them That's in thirty right. second bites. Yeah. For our show. Yes, needed, released today. Needed uh, needed to speed up a little bit. Get to the tears a little faster if you're going <laughs> to go more syrupy. Sacks. If you're going to go more syrupy sacks. and sentimental, you got to listen at one point eight speed like I do to my own podcast. What's what's the name of my man that was a, the saxophonist for E Street Band? Because he was the Clarence, only black guy. Uh, in the... Yeah, Clarence uh, Clemens. 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 Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Thanks, Roy. You're welcome. <laughs> That's actually a Miami guy, the saxophonist on that song. Uh, nobody wants more details on this. <laughs> okay. Whittingham, can you uh, get the letter? Gary the bag was a friend of mine. I thought Paul Radke was the friend of yours. <laughs> I, I had I, more than one friend. I think I Venmoed <laughs> Gary the bag $1,000 last month. <laughs> what? Why? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, oh, 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 again. again. <laughs> Whittingham, you. Gary the bag was a friend <laughs> of mine. Thank you. Gary the Bag was a friend of mine. <laughs> That's right. I love the song, even if Levitar doesn't. <laughs> I mean, there was a nice little subtle hint about uh, the show and cracking open a mic with your son. It was, it, it, I have to admit, I wanted to mock the whole thing, but I, it, it gave me the feels. Yeah, it's, I, like, I, it's a I, song you'd play at Greg Cody's funeral. Yeah. Thank no, you. Yeah, Please. What? Yeah. Why did it well, turn I'm just saying, it was, if you were listening to the lyrics, it's like about his life and talking, right. being on the radio with Dan, doing a podcast with yeah. me. Dan like, wasn't listening. He was he was setting up uh, whatever we should play it again. snide remark he was going to make. We're going to play it one more time. We're going to play it again. No, don't play it again. No, 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 play it again. He really needs to get it. This is a great, great job of songwriting. Now the wall at 1440 to the test of time. The scent of Villa Rose flows through the Pizza floor shop. of the pine. Gary the bag was a friend of mine. <laughs> the wall at 1440 stood the test of time. You never know when it will be the time for letting go. It is so about that. You take a walk with me. That's you. I wish I could cry on you. <laughs> this part's about me coming up. That's you. The times I miss the hard network house. <laughs> I was waiting for a little more funny instead of sentimental. I was... And I'll occasionally pick up sets with a fake bird on a newspaper. <laughs> well, not everything can be funny in life, Dan. You know, sometimes there's a there's a time for serious. I'll go six months with missing the benchmark I'm known for. <laughs> No, that lyric does not work. No, I'm back I'm sorry. my day no. this week, Dan. <laughs> I've taken advantage of a friendship. If this were an actual meritocracy, I'd never be here. All right, that'll be in the sequel. That, that'll be in the uh, in the next I, single. I would just wait for someone to shout, ladies and gentlemen, the ghost of Clarence Clemens on the saxophone. <laughs> Do you have a back in my day? No. What are you doing there, Cruddy Springsteen? Did you hurt yourself doing Cruddy Springsteen? I just... <laughs> you thought he was doing a Springsteen no. dance move. I just hit my knee on this goddamn desk. <laughs> well, now you actually sound like Bruce Evans. Oh, Susie. <laughs> Susie. I heard Springsteen in the other room. And, it was and just... I banged my knee against the center console. <laughs> That's more 90s kind of, uh, was it Pearl Jam sounding? Yeah. Yeah, 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 I gotta yeah. find it. Do you let you in her? All right, there I am. Mm -hmm. more, mm -hmm. more angst. There you go. Roy's got yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. You gotta me, have... me, 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 me. Yeah. <laughs> me, 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 me. <laughs> you were in pain, and I thought you were doing. This is what <laughs> I, I, mean, all I said was for no, the love of I, Susie. I, 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 I'm gonna explain. For the love of Susie. <laughs> 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 gonna, I like this. Hold on. I'm going to explain what I saw to the audience, which is it's Chris Whittingham saying four, three, 
two, okay? And then I'm not looking, right? And I just hear catch before it clips on the last sound, something that sounds like Springsteen. And I think you're laughing at yourself because you're red faced, but it's because you're in physical pain. And you, I just caught the first part of For the Love of Susie. <laughs> and I thought it was your Springsteen. And I thought you were laughing at your own Springsteen. Instead, you just hurt your knee There's on the no console. Like the most physical pain I feel in my life is when I bang my knee on this damn thing. It's been, it's been, I just want to get rid of, we need a new setup. Do. I don't know what the we deal do. is. It has it been too long. Just, it is. It's been I too long. It's a work injury risk. <laughs> I'm sorry. I am sorry that it made you shout for the love of And Susie. I predicted it. You asked me to scoot over <laughs> earlier in the show. I was like, I'm going to bang my knee on this gun. <laughs> We're in the weeds now. Should, Back it to you. shouldn't be there. It should, we <laughs> should be better. You for it. After all these years, we should be better. It shouldn't be whatever it is that ESPN built out of wood and sparklers back there. <laughs> <laughs> it should be a better thing. You guys deserve better. I'm can... over for Mica. I got to tell you, for, there's a reason why for Mica is no longer acceptable. I am promising you on behalf of Metal Arc Media as a company, we will do better soon. Soon. I'm talking to you guys and I'm talking to everybody listening to this. Soon this will be better. All of it will be better and you will not bump your knee and do fake Springsteen and we will lose that forever. Like that moment will be lost because you'll be in a suit back there looking yep. like Field Yates doing the show ESPN <laughs> wanted you to do before they dumped you in the street. <laughs> Table made up for my car. <laughs> I, I like I like how every melody is still dancing in the dark. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a song. It's him, I'm yeah. picturing uh, is it Courtney Cox yeah. like dancing across from him discovered on the Do you know that's the that's the origin of the Carlton dance? It's li that's what inspired it. Literally Courtney Cox dancing in that video. That's also where she was discovered, correct? Yep. Well, I think she was I mean that wasn't that wasn't a real concert, right? No. It no. was a music video. Yeah. yeah, and so she was discovered at some point before that. That's how she was in the music video. Whittingham, the letter that you got because you've been soliciting old-fashioned letters. Greg Cody loves a letter, right? People are still writing letters to yeah. the newspaper trying to reach you, even though uh, the physical offices of the newspaper aren't even there anymore. Correct. correct? Yeah, it goes to a dead letter file or something. I don't know. You don't even get them? No, I, no, I don't know how to get them physically <laughs> anymore. There is no office. Like, there's no Miami Herald building. It's weird. You do not know how to get letters written to you by readers. It is the, the, the one of the uh, simplest ways of communication. You are don't know how to do it. No. Because he's not going to give away his home address. Right. Right? So yeah. th this would be the only location, right? So if a reader to a newspaper wishes to write something and communicate with somebody, if they do not do it by email, it is not available to them. Right. I mean, theoretically, somebody can leave me a phone message, but, you know. Hopefully. I didn't realize that that had died. Yeah, man. Okay. Yeah. So that's, uh, I we mean, didn't. I still get tons of emails. You know, people can still contact me, but. Well, it has not died here. Chris Whittingham, old soul that he is, is soliciting from all of America and North America and everywhere that you listen to this, really. He is promising you that your complaints about the show that they will be heard, if not read on the air, if you write them in personal letter form, keep the stamp industry alive, yeah. help the U.S. postal system, Bezos wants everything. Uh, just, what do you have? Let him have it. Bezos, if he wants it, let him have it. Retail, all of retail. Have I mean, it. He, already, mail system? He, he already took everything. all of retail. Take it. You, look, as long as I can get a return on my phone, and then they say, you know what, just keep it. We'll give you the money back. You know what? Take it. Take it all, man. You got it. That happens a lot, right? It happens quite a bit. Are also, you? the entire system for returning things with Amazon, even if you do have to take it back, you literally just take the item to a UPS store, give it to them, and leave. Scan scan my phone. It's it's unbelievable he how deserves quick it, it is. You know what? You win. <laughs> It's spillage over the side, right? Some of the math on some of this stuff. I thought Walmart was uh, just rigging the system back when they could deal with $3 billion in credit card fraud every year because <laughs> ah. they were just selling so much, right? Like, I thought that that was the industry cheating. But keeping your returns, because Amazon is just like bleep it. You know how much <laughs> gas it, it cost here to bring that, like, one ninety nine cent bracelet you wrote for that, you bought for that costume? Like, wait, there, uh, how much... How much of this is happening right now? How many millions? How many millions? Oh, <laughs> Lord, here we go. Wait a Tango. Where is the How letter? How many millions? 
<laughs> you guys must stop this. You must stop polluting this show with a Sylvester Stallone movie, 40 years old, that you're doing impersonations of characters. Nobody listened to this. As Bruce you're, Springsteen. You're, you are actively, you are I just actively want to make very clear. alienating the audience by doing Jack Balance, who died 20 years ago, as a villainous character who was holding two mice to mice, right? Yes. And he was chasing around Sylvester Stallone and that guy with the giant chin. Kurt They're, Russell. Kurt Russell. No, 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 that's not a, that's not a laugh. That's just a nice little bit of information. Did you not know that? Again, with a, your 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 asshole is the source of pepperoni. Oh, I thought you were calling me one. <laughs> oh, oh. No, this is true. Google it. What Look it up. The last two. Two. The last guy, no one's here. Do little research. Up. That's not the giant. The last two words. How much you want to bet? Kurt How much Russell. you want to? Let's do this. How much you want to bet me? I don't want to do it that way. Uh, that's right. You gambling. I, I, gambling. I, I yeah. would like everyone. Let's Jinx. go a half unit. <laughs> a little half unit. I would like my fiat wallet. Everyone listening to this <laughs> to simply Google giant jaw guy from Tango and Cash and then Google the recent photos of Oscar De La Hoya with his eyes as wide as saucers going crazy because he might be. Uh, uh, Many have alleged. Many have alleged that he, uh, yes, that there might be some help that he's getting there pharmaceutically. Any reason as to why? Kurt Russell would be the last two words of Walt Disney. I know he was like a child star, so maybe he was still trying to cast a role. Well, we're still we're still trying to prove if it's true. Oh, we it don't is. know. Uh, we don't know your story. Oh, you can take this one to the bank. I've never been more certain of anything. Is that right? Yeah, Kurt Russell. All it would seem. Walt Disney's last two words were Kurt Russell. <laughs> still waiting for someone to tell me I'm wrong. Uh, <laughs> you, you will be waiting for a while. Let's get. I'll this. be waiting forever. This letter. I'm not. Let's get this letter going. As uh, the we search the entire. made of asshole. <laughs> so has not been disproven. <laughs> so we were trying. So Greg felt uh, particularly attacked after today's edition of the Big Suey, uh, particularly from his son. Yeah. And so I said, Greg, you know, we have... It was it was shocking, okay? It was legitimately shocking. And Chris, you and I have been getting this criticism a lot, that we're too mean to your old man as, uh, as you know, he comes in here and does the show and does his best, and that you and I specifically... Does his best is debatable. <laughs> right, didn't do... Do you have your back in my day today? No. Hell no. Uh, Chris, we have been identified as being too harsh on him, but during Big Suey, you hit him with an acidic spray of you have been useless this segment, and it had two decades of he's your father resentment behind the, the useless had so much chest in it. I mean, we were all dancing that segment. The segment was flowing, and my dad's contributions were just little tiny lines, none of which were helpful, just absurd, nonsensical. A lot of them didn't even make sense. So I just after the fifth one, I was just like, you've been sense. useless. But this is, someone took the time to write a letter and put a stamp on it in defense of Greg Cody against our onslaught or the shows. What is it? Yeah, so it's a letter that was sent to us, which, by the way, was the inspiration for me soliciting letters from the audience. Audience. We got four more yesterday uh, that, that I was handed after the show. Again, I will only take criticism of the show via letter. So uh, this is from Rob of, from Spencer, Indiana. And Rob says, Greg Cody Tuesday used to be my favorite day of the week, but with Dan and Chris constantly attacking everything Greg says or does, it has gotten to the point I spend the entire show dreading either of them saying anything. Chris is especially petulant and childish in his behavior toward his father. No matter what Greg says, Chris is going to attack, belittle, make fun of, or just childishly put down, and it is fairly obvious why. Maybe have Chris take the day off when Greg is going to be on. Whoa. Something needs to be done. It isn't fun or funny anymore. Signed, Greg Cody. Rob in Spencer, Indiana. I did type that letter so my handwriting couldn't be identified. Yeah, I was going to say, we can't accept any letter that's typed up. Yeah, I get that. Yeah, yeah, that's you want to send in a letter, mm -hmm. you I grab do. yourself a pen yep. you and a paper, yeah, you and it. you show us your penmanship. Mm -hmm. That's what this is all about. Get on. Revive the dying form of cursive. 
We can get into that later. Oh, an no, embarrassment. But I, I can't make a Z I don't want to read cursive letters, so type them out for me, please. I can't yes, make a please. Z in cursive. Good, uh, good letter. It's like we're rude. Really enjoyed that. It I, says in the letter you. that we all know why. What's the why? Why are you so mean to your father? Or what? What I? It, 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 <laughs> I need to go to therapy. I don't know why. Why am I mean to him? I can take a few guesses. Greg, do you have a back of my day today? No. That's it. There you go. How many times right, do I got to yeah. say no? <laughs> By the way, uh, we get that in on the podcast on my podcast as well. Yeah, uh, could, could it no just blood. be that you're annoying? It's as a, I would consider could, that as a remote possibility, I guess. Could it be know. that you're very easily irritable with your father? Yes, yeah. but aren't like, we all? You go from there zero go. to 100 yes. very quickly. We're all Thank irritable you, with our parents. You don't get irritable, irritated, irritated I, 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 with your dad? I, 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 you don't get irritated with your parents? No. Okay. Not that quickly. You should try working with them. Oh, that's a good point. The golden boy. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm going to side with uh, Chris Cody. Try working with your dad. <laughs> <laughs> you guys made that choice. <laughs> Fair. I've got an answer Fair. for the Walt Disney thing. False. No. What? False. You can't do this. <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah, no. no. Here, Mike here, Ryan on behalf of stubborn here, defiance. Here's my source. Is it Walt Disney? No, it's Kurt Russell. Wow. Those, those words mean anything to you? Not even <laughs> Kurt Russell. <laughs> no? No, I have the Kurt Russell quote here. You want the Kurt Russell quote? It's his last two words. This is, But this is Kurt Russell is told to the Huffington Post. I assume, as does everybody else, that he was talking about some movie that he was thinking about having me in. I don't know what to make of it other than that. He's referring to not Walt Disney's dying words spoken, but a note that he wrote on, and he wrote right prior to Perhaps passing. Perhaps he was intubated. And the, okay, but the These no- are his final two sure, words. Sure, So these are the notes that were written. The notes were Ron Miller, hyphen, two-way down cellar, number two, Kurt Russell, and he misspelled Kurt. Number three, CIA Mobley. His last two words wow. in writing were I, CIA Mobley. Okay. Then I lay my shield down. I was Kurt Russell it's was his sh- second last sure words. Sure of anything that you've ever been. This is also more reporting being wait, done. How wait. Those were his last words, technically. Technically. Well, they pulled, Mike's right. They pulled yeah, me into it was the, one it was one solid note. So we're gonna take the entirety of the note and consider them his last words. You said words. his last two words, though. I did. And Kurt, for that, I apologize. Kurt but Russell technically, I was right. Apologizes, Bruce Springsteen. I am Mike Ryan on, beh- <laughs> on, on behalf, behalf of, of stubborn, stubborn defiance. Stubborn defiance. <laughs> Grudging apologies. I will not apologize. <laughs> Seems like there was a group of words and Kurt misspelled was one of them. <laughs> <laughs> Quote, they pulled me into the office a couple years after he died. And this woman, who I don't believe it was his secretary, but it might have been, I don't know, pointed to something he wrote. And she said, do you know what that's about? And I said, no, I don't. She said, because he wrote something after it, but then he went back up and he wrote your name. That was the last thing he wrote. And I said, oh, gee, I don't know what it's connected to. This story continues to disappoint. What are you talking about? You, I illuminated you in the audience. Most people don't know this useless bit I, of trivia. But I, now I've got more questions than and I had before. Did the CIA before. kill Walt Disney? Yeah. Mobley. A man named Mobley was, was responsible <laughs> And now, according to the assistant, who I think is the most trustworthy in this bunch, says he wrote some other words down, but then went back to Kurt Russell. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm not believing this. I'm not believing any part of this. But uh, what we should be praising is that Walt Disney was very impressed with Kurt Russell's acting. And he said, quote, a great acting future for Kurt Russell. This is when he was like 15 years and old. Mean, and he knew it. He uh, called I mean, it out. Right. Have Yo. you seen Executive Decision? My God, pa. You seen Tango and Cash? Of course, but I mean, Executive Decision. It was kind of like Gabriel. You know Cash. how? You know how? Like no, uh, no, we no, can't keep no, doing no, this. No, we no, cannot no. keep doing this. Forty-year-old movie. What? What did Tango and Cash get on Rotten so Tomatoes? There was we, like there was this weird portion in the late '90s, early 2000s, where big action movies came in pairs. Like you couldn't just have one mm-hmm. Earth destroyed by an asteroid movie. They mm-hmm. had to come out months apart. Mm-hmm. There were two. Political figures are on a hijacked airplane. Mm-hmm. Action movies around the same time. Air Force, Air Force One, One, but people forget decision. Executive Decision, mm-hmm. where oh, Steven Seagal yeah. is in it for about five seconds. Wasn't Kurt Russell? I get choked up talking about an Executive Decision <laughs> too, because I wanted to. See, I, the marketing plan was that Steven Seagal was going to be in it for a long time. He was all over like the trailer, mm-hmm. but no, he gets caught in like some sort of transport from one plane to another. Sucked right out of there. Altitude. So basically, it was Samuel L. Jackson and Deep Lucy. Yes. 
But wasn't Kurt Russell also like surfing on fire as snake plinks skin or something? Escape trying from, uh, to uh, like escape from New York, York and King of uh, Escape, Escape from LA. Escape from LA. Escape, from, Escape New from New York. York. Yeah. See, well, we did that in reverse order. The sequel was Escape from LA. Yeah. Snake somehow made he, it to the other coast. He was in yeah. both of them surfing a wave of fire, or no, just in the California one, one surfing no, no, a wave of fire. No, just the California one. Just California one. Yeah, you remember that poster, don't you? <laughs> I mean, but, but it's, <laughs> you, I, I remember. College Oh, my room. God. Kurt Russell and Stallone in a movie together. <laughs> Yo, my, Amazing. My freshman year in college, this kid named Scott Serban was my, was my roommate. And Escape from uh, L.A. was coming out. And he was so hyped for it. He's like, oh, my God. They finally made a sequel to this. And I was like, <laughs> I, so just, bad. I don't know, man. <laughs> like, that was I'm, an awful so movie. I'm looking at this poster. <laughs> Surfing a, a wave of fire. fire. It, that that's is like the Tug Speedman uh, Scorcher franchise. <laughs> <laughs> it was just a open. wave. It was just a giant. <laughs> was it just a giant wave through California on the streets? On like, Was it a wave on a highway in California? It was something ridiculous. I don't know, but the eye patch is fire. Uh, to answer your question on Rotten Tomatoes, Tango and Cash received 31% from the critics, 52% from the audience. Crowd pleaser. Wow. The winner. Um, I mean, I wanted to ask you about everything that's happened here with the Kyler Murray contract situation. <laughs> wave of fire it is literally a wave of fire it's like cresting at the top with flames and he's surfing <laughs> snake is back is the tagline <laughs> so it was escape from la yeah <laughs> terrible yeah like unbelievably bad what that get on rotten tomatoes was it was it worse than tango and cash did john carpenter do that one yes he did john carpenter's escape from la and yeah. surprisingly 53 percent from the critics 39% from the audience score. You know what that means, Roy? Cinephobe eligible. Mm -hmm. You've never done it. Never done Escape from L.A., but <laughs> it's always the first time for everything. John Carpenter also did Ghosts of Mars, right? Oh, with uh, with the Ice, Ice Cube. Cube. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you watch that one? I sure did. Oh, oh my so God, excited. is that So excited. To, oh, Ice Cube in space? How could they go wrong? <laughs> That's a young mean thought. Cinephobe, wherever it is that you get your podcasts, uh, Greg Cody, I wanted to ask you before we throw it to Amin, your thoughts on what happened with Kyler Murray, the homework clause, and then uh, I was surprised that the disrespect was so profound that the Cardinals pulled the clause and with a statement that says it was clearly perceived as... Uh, in ways that were never intended, <laughs> and I, I ridiculous that, as a statement that seemed amazing to uh, me. How could it be perceived as anything other than you were basically telling the star of your team you're either not smart enough or you're not working hard enough? I mean, it, the implication is one of those two things, at least in public perception, if not in reality. Just a, a, a great mistake by the franchise. But then to pull it back and eliminate the clause once you've got it, I mean, and it can put the thing into default. What were your I, thoughts I as an executive? Blew my mind that they would capitulate to public perception on a contract clause that was negotiated and agreed to. Are you freaking kidding me? Oh, but it looks... Who cares? The kid signed it. His agent told him to sign it. Uh, it's unbelievable that people would have an issue with this. If it's If it's that bad of a clause, then the kid wouldn't have signed it. It's, Maybe his agent signed it for him. I we mean, didn't sign it for him. You don't sign no, it. No, no, but 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 maybe the agent knew more about this clause than Kyler did. I don't man. know how closely players read Look, contracts. So aren't you aren't you in essence doing worse than what the Cardinals allegedly did? Like you're insulting the intelligence of Kyler Murray that he wouldn't even read his contract and know what's in it. If if the allegation is to put a homework clause in there means you're insulting his intelligence. Isn't the allegation that he didn't read this freaking contract the same kind of thing? Was Kyler Murray uh, upset by it? Did he feel it was disrespectful? Yes. Okay. Hold Isn't on. that enough it, reason to say, you know what, this was a bad clause. Let's get rid of it. Is, he, is Kyler Murray a it. fringe NFL player? I'm sorry. I, I know I'm not a football specialist. Is he a fringe NFL player? If I don't sign this deal, well, maybe there won't be a home for me. Or is he one of the exciting young quarterbacks in this league who has a ton of options and would have no shortage of suitors if he were on the market. The reality is, this is a negotiation. People put things in contracts that are to be negotiated. And everything is negotiable in it, right? So the idea that somehow, by the way, also, 
why would they put that clause in there? That Not for a rookie, not for someone they just drafted who they don't know. Someone who's been in their building for a couple of years now. They put that clause in there. Why would they do that? I would guess it's because Kyler Murray maybe has a history of not doing enough film study on his own. But that's something that needs to be private between the club and it the is? quarterback. Not put out there in a contract. So, okay, so, so that's the interesting part. It's not that they put it in the contract, Greg. It's why do we know? Why was that publicized? Why was that leaked? Because I don't know the details of Tom Brady's contract. Right. I don't know the details of Aaron Rodgers' contract. I don't even know the details of right. Ryan Tannehill's contract. Why do I know the details of his contract? That was leaked by somebody. Whom? We don't know. Might have been the team. Might have been the agent who was pissed that his, his client d- demanded to sign it because he was scared or whatever. I don't know. But, but what I'm saying is the existence of the clause... There's nothing wrong with that because it's negotiated and because it's addressing something that clearly was a concern. The the part where the Cardinals are like, Twitter was mad and they had to pull it back, that's even more insane to me than even having it in there it in the was, first place. The quote, it was clearly perceived in ways that were never intended. What am I missing? What could it possibly be why that they're trying to say with that sentence? Why, why would they care? Well, perception does matter. No, it doesn't. Kyler came out. And had a press conference uh-huh. where he lamented it uh-huh. okay. after agreeing to the, the clause. Okay. All right. And? People were making assumptions. By that Thanksgiving, do you think it's an issue still? No, I think it, it goes out. Okay. That was attributed so, to July. So sometimes people are going to react to stuff that they don't know enough about. Again, they put that clause in there. It's not because he's a black quarterback, because there have been plenty of black quarterbacks who haven't had that clause in their contract. It's not because they don't know him, because he's been there a couple of years. They put it in there for a reason. They argued for it, they fought for it, and they won the argument. It's That's it. Case closed. He's happy. He's not happy. That's his deal. This is the NFL. Deal with it. The idea that they would be swayed by public reaction to a privately negotiated contract is insane to me. I get what you're saying as somebody from, and this is something that's happened on air with you recently, where there have been a handful of times where you've looked up and I'm like, oh, okay, I've arrived at an uh, age where I'm looking at things the way they were. Young player, that important, gets his feelings hurt and takes down his social media with the Cardinals and now comes out in a way that adds fuel to the fire right at the start of signing that contract. Yeah, organization betrayed me, joke, disrespect, didn't do team player stuff. That's a different athlete for a different time who doesn't care very much what you, the executive, thinks. Don't hurt his feelings that way. He's the star of your team. You've insulted him. Okay. You, you've treated him as not... Uh, he's your star, and whether you think it's sensitive or not, he's still your star. And it appears that he it bothered him. So, again, was he bothered by the clause, or was he bothered by the publicity around it and what people were reacting and was like, hey, that's a good point. They are making me... Is that what happened? Or is it... Because here's the deal. Here's another scenario for you. Hey, uh, Kyler, here's the deal. We're going to pay you $200 million, whatever. By the way... We want you to do four hours of homework. And he says, this is bullshit. Hey, uh, the Cardinals are at, go on Twitter or on Instagram. They're, they're offering me a deal that's insulting my intelligence here. That's what someone who is empowered and uh, a modern-day athlete who is insulted would do. They would immediately reveal the insult. They wouldn't say, oh, you got a point. Give me that pen. <laughs> it, this is unfair. Why'd you sign it? Why'd you sign it? And by the way, and let's just assume that he didn't know or whatever, right? And he signs it, and after he signs it, he figures it out. And now his feelings are hurt, and we have to care about his feelings. Well, it's a story because it became public. It became public, absolutely. But the the hurt feelings and that you have to care about his feelings. I'm I'm not like a, a Neanderthal where I'm like, just get in line. Business is business. But also, when you go down that line where you are worried about the feelings of your star player for a contract that he signed not years ago... A week ago, when you go down that, that's how you get to Kyrie and Kevin Durant. That's that's the land you've landed in. Where it's like, just don't be mad. Don't be. You know, sometimes people have to have their feelings hurt. Sometimes they got to be mad. Sometimes they got to just deal with stuff that what didn't break in their favor. We can't be in the business of continuously trying to placate athletes, right? 
I'm not saying it's got to be run like but, the military. Uh, but, uh, no, but I but mean, the, the, the in, opposite. In, in, in like, that extreme. situation, most quarterbacks take one for the team. And the culture of what football's always been, that insult, the quarterback does not make it worse by being f hurt feelings in public. And it's a new age. Like, that's not who your quarterback is anymore. He's a little guy who scrambles, who changes the rules, and he's got a different temperament than some of the others. He's also a little guy that falls apart in the second half of the season, not just physically. I mean, you you all saw that playoff game. It was bizarre. There are times where he appears healthy, and teams that have had more than one look at him kind of get wise to his game. And it does help frame. That clause does kind of help explain what's happened the last two seasons but they where took he's not the same out. player at the second half. They took, they took it, it out. out because they capitulated to mass hysteria of people who don't operate inside the walls of your organization. We don't matter. I could be here on the other side saying, that's an insult to Kyler Murray. I don't matter. You don't matter. None of us matter. All that matters are the people in that building. Kyler Murray, the general manager, the head coach, his agent, and 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 the owner of the team. Those are the people that matter. And they listen to not the people who matter. They listen to us clowns just with a hot take and, and a gut feeling. Mike, do you remember in the bubble when the players were thinking about not playing because of all the, the, the racial tension and strife, right? And then they talked about it, and they said, "Look, man, financially, it's a good thing for our, you know, our, our constituency." And then they put it up for the executive board, and it came back unanimous: "We're going to play in this bubble." And after it was okay, we're going to do it. Kyrie Irving said, "I don't know, guys. He's on the executive board. You voted for it. You didn't fight hard for it, but because." People started saying, the NBA players sold out. Hey, yeah, we did sell out. Like, I'm not here for people being swayed by what Twitter thinks, by what Instagram thinks. It, that's not a well, way to well, do the, business. Well, the, the Cardinals just got bullied by uh, how that, uh, how all of that happened. They more allowed them. More context, Kyler Murray openly admitted last December in a New York Times profile that he doesn't watch a lot of film. He's quoted, I think I was blessed with the cognitive skills to just go out there and just see it before it happens. I am not one of those guys that's going to sit there and kill myself watching film. It's totally plausible after him openly saying that, that they would put that clause in there. Now, you know what the counterpoint is, right? Because I came up with a counterpoint against this. The counterpoint is that football glorifies and mythologizes the concept of overwork. You were prepared for this question? I, I was, yeah. You knew I was going to ask you this. Mm-hmm. You prepared. You wrote notes. I wrote notes, Dan. Along oh, with my, I'm I'm very jealous of you. Point counterpointed yourself. I counterpointed you, you myself. Have, you're looking at your phone now and reading material. That is not something I see happen around here uh, very uh, often. Along with my uh, Ron McGill question, I swam by a stingray. Was I in danger? That's for next week. Next <laughs> okay. time I'm on, I'm going to ask him that. <laughs> you, one. Forgot, alert. You, you forgot for, that note. You forgot to ask. No, no, no. It. I didn't want to over. I have a, a bunch of Ron McGill questions that I just write every time I think of one, and so every week I'll have a question. Every or every time I'm here. I like doing that. I like writing notes. That's I thought I had a good prep. one with how many times would you have died in colonial times? <laughs> like a fart in the wind. <laughs> how many times? You guys are going to have to help me because I don't watch Below Deck and I don't watch P-Valley. Are you guys judging the tastes of Jamel Hill when she says that some of the things that she's watching, uh, when you're roaring with laughter, is it because you know something about P-Valley that I don't know? Yeah, I watch P-Valley as well. And it is as soap opera as soap opera gets. Uh, and I've known this about Jamel. We've been friends for a while. I know Jamel has like two parallel tastes going on. There's like the stuff that she likes is really well done, well written. And then she just likes the stuff that's, let's just call it fluff. Junk. Junk. She's got like, she's got a sweet tooth. For right. junk she, TV. she likes that sugar. You uh, you have guilty and not guilty pleasures. Below deck, you're proud of it. You don't, you're defiant. You're proudly defiant about, I'm a below deck. I've been on it. I drank too much. I think there was a penis cake of some sort and I got drunk. Uh, yeah, that that pretty much. God damn, that was a very accurate synopsis right there. Um, yeah, I'm not ashamed of being part of the Below Deck franchise hive. I like Below Deck, Below Deck Sailing, Below Deck Mediterranean. Give me all the Below Decks. All the, the I'm franchise. here for it. Uh, <laughs> but P Valley, though, um, you know, especially this past this last episode, uh, I think it's one of the funnier episodes. I don't know how you feel about it to me that they've ever had. 
I think I want on my obituary, I hold so you could fly. I want that line <laughs> on my obituary. The, the, the streets know my knees was the line that killed me. The streets <laughs> know my knees. I was like, I, I was deceased. And uh, I know the, uh, the, the head writer and one of the executive producers for the show. And I, I was emailing with him, Patrick Ian Pope. Um, and I was, I told him there were so many classic lines in this one. Great value, Barack Obama. I mean, there was just, it was so much going on, but I, I really do um, enjoy some P-Valley. That is not why we brought her on. We brought her on <laughs> to talk about Beyonce's new album. That's right. <laughs> because Mike Ryan's got opinions. And what? I, I, my, yeah, I love the album. I, I love the, uh, I like Lemonade. I really get down with Queen B. So, <laughs> what? What? What surprised you about those kids? Oh. What? Okay. No, so right. I, she's obviously, there's this trend going on in hip hop. Drake tried it out too, where you, you tap into deep house tracks. I think Beyonce did it way better. I love the album. Um, mixed messages on what the lyrical content is, but, you know, Beyonce is very strong <laughs> and wants to make sure that she projects that. But I don't know. A lot of these songs sound like they're about fucking. <laughs> Well, some of them are, to be fair. Um, and she, you know, listen, she's trying to showcase herself as a fully realized woman. Um, yes, she is the mother of three kids. Yes, she is married to Jay-Z. But, you know, when it's time to get down, she down with the get down. And um, I, this album, it just sent me through so many emotional um, feelings. You know, there were parts of it where I felt like my credit score is not high enough. To <laughs> there, were, there were other parts where I felt myself being transported to Tulum. It was just so much that was going on. But I do think, you know, I know some people have said this is her best album. This is better than B-Day, which many consider to be her best album. I don't, I don't, I, I can't really judge because I think they're just, this is so different. Uh, and a friend of mine who's in the music industry explained something to me is that artists like her and even Drake, and I know people have banged on him for the project that he put up that is, you know, trying to tap into, you know, that house EDM uh, kind of crowd. But I think music is so fast as the pace of it. And so Beyonce always being a trendsetter, always being a revolutionary in whatever she does, you know, she gave you an album for the club. And I think for the Black queer community, they are just really uh, understandably um, joyous about this album because they feel like they're being celebrated much like Madonna did the same I think for mm -hmm. probably the white queer community so just for it to be an all hands-on celebration you know but Beyonce did cause some trouble in my household let me just say this uh, real quickly my husband who listened to the album loves the album and he looked at me in all seriousness and asked me why I can't talk to him the way Beyonce talks to Jay-Z. <laughs> <Now, and that, laughs> and I was like, what? Oh, no. Because I, I, for, I forgot what song oh, it was yeah. where she said something like, you know, you could just be yourself. I just love it when you're yourself around me or something like that. It was a very sweet <laughs> lyric. And it was in that moment that I contemplated burying him in our backyard. But, <laughs> you know, I was like, talk to you like Beyonce. Like, <laughs> are, you, are you serious? I want Beyonce to talk to me like Beyonce. <laughs> okay? Are you kidding me? I hope, the beehive so, knows, um, I hope the beehive knows that this is not an insult. I've heard songwriters talk about how collaborative the songwriting process is with Beyonce and how it is with other artists. And she, she really gets in there, but it's a little weird to t to have someone else speak on your love life and then you sing it. It just kind of feels a little weird. It 26 kinda, writers, right? Yeah, 26 yeah. writers. She, she, she works very hard when it comes to the collaboration process and other people are writing about what it feels like to have sex with Jay-Z. It's, <laughs> it's just kind of, it's just kind of weird. It'd be kind of like if Bruce Springsteen sang some of these lyrics, it would <laughs> land the same way. Like, them. Cuddled up on the couch, <laughs> motorboat baby spin around. Wait, wait, what? It says huh? that? Yeah, cuddled up on the couch, motorboat baby spin around. <laughs> like wow. you're on Jeff Darlington's finger. It's not true. I cannot Hell yeah. <laughs> I hope it's true. Put it on the poll as well. When it's time to get down, is it time to get down with the get down? Because uh, I, 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 I don't know if I was agreeing with that, but I felt like I should be. 
<laughs> and there, there, there's distinctive differences. There's the get down, and there, there's the get down to the get down. You know what I'm saying? Like you have to. It's levels to it. It is really hard, though. Competitive. We talked about how aging, how T Troy Aikman is now doing these exercises because he's got to ward off uh, t Tom Brady in the booth and young people coming for the spaces that the older generation, the icons, have. The fact that she's still out here, that Jay-Z doesn't, Jay-Z's not retired, but he's saying, I'm not exactly making music now, that she would continue to rise to the challenge of, uh, at this age, with nothing left to accomplish? Like, we don't have a lot of artists like that. No, and and continuing to set trends, it's one thing to follow trends. It's another thing to be able to set them and to completely change the marketplace. I mean, Beyonce, she was the one dropping secret al albums. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, she doesn't even need marketing anymore. She's just like, you know what? I feel like an album right now. Friday, y'all get one, you know? And so um, just what she's done to the music industry has just really been transformative. Um, I've been blessed and fortunate enough to see some great artists perform in concert over my life um you know for a long time janet jackson to me held that that mantle i've seen janet multiple times and she was great but i i do think now it is you know with no hyperbole really no argument like beyonce is the greatest entertainer of this generation and she's definitely firmly in the conversation if not leading the conversation for greatest entertainer of all time and i cannot wait for this tour likely i'll have to take out a second mortgage i'm sure to afford these tickets but <laughs> Given how Renaissance, uh, the, the track flow and the transitions, this is going to be an opportunity. I've already seen her walk on water at a concert at, in Baltimore, like at MCI Stadium. She walked on water, Dan. Water, okay? And so I can only imagine the type of choreography, um, the type of routine that she's going to put behind Renaissance. This is going to be her magnum opus. And even though she keeps giving us that every single album so her level of excellence is just something that we just have not seen from an artist very rarely i should say kiss me where you bruise me <laughs> taste me on that fleshy part really yeah really the taste me on that fleshy part taste me not touch me taste, taste me on that fleshy part wow wow bruce that Jeez, I, know I scream so loud i curse the stars above <laughs> Jamel, so I'm, talking <laughs> I'm talking about the clitoris. I'm talking about the clitoris. Yes, I am. Now we're out here riffing. And I'm going to try to find it if I can. <laughs> okay. well, wonderful rendition. <laughs> Top five Jamel Hill entertainers she's seen in person. Are you ready? I know you have this in your back pocket somewhere. Uh, we already know yep. what number one is, but we've got to do it uh, because you've been blessed in your life to see so many of them. We need the top five. Where you were, what was going on in your life? Number five, Jamel. Oh, man, you're going to actually make me rank them? Okay, that that's fine. Um, well, there's one I cannot name. So I, I I just have to kick him off the list. And oh, if, oh, cancel! You know I I, oh, I, I can't I, I can't name him. I, I just can't. But it, it, it's it's unfortunately true. So let me go one to five. Uh, <laughs> or no, I guess that gives away. Yeah. This. Yeah, no. <laughs> well, we already have another one. No, this is hard. This is not easy to do yeah. on the fly for anybody. So I'm going to filibuster for you a minute here. But I am confused. I believe perhaps you've been to an R. Kelly concert. No, no, I, don't I, say I, the I, name. I, I don't know. I'm such an idiot. I, so I I'm number four. Okay, I'll go five. I'll, I'll go with five. Five is Mary J. Blige. Um, I've seen Mary J. A number of, of of times. I mean, she would be. I'm a. I would put. She would be in my top five. But I'm a. That other person is permanently banned. They yes. cannot be in it. Okay. But five is Mary. I've seen the Share My World tour. Oh wow. Um. God, I've seen. Geez, I've not my life. What was after Share My World? Whatever was after Share My World, I've seen that. I've seen her at least, um, I don't know, probably six times. So oh, wow. love me some Mary. Yeah. You can't um, motherfucker. <laughs> Boy, you growing <laughs> on me. I just wanna touch you. I can feel it through your jeans. <laughs> Fleshy part. <laughs> uh Number four for me in terms of uh, great performances I've seen in, in concert, I, I would say Jill Scott. I saw Jill Scott in a club. <laughs> I saw Jill Scott uh, in a in a club called, it's not even a club, it's called St. Andrew's Hall. It's in Detroit. And it, it was with um, uh, a then boyfriend who was 
a terrible person, but we're not going to even get into that. <laughs> but the one thing, <laughs> but the one thing that I got out of the relationship was Jill Scott because he introduced me to Jill Scott, and during a blizzard of epic, epic proportions, he drug me to see this woman I had not heard of, and this was her first mm. album. So getting out, uh, getting in the way was just kind of coming out and, and really gaining some momentum. And when I tell you that's one of the most fabulous vocal performances I've ever heard, it's it was astonishing what this woman could do with vocals. Number three. He didn't give you anything else, this terrible person that I thought you just said drugged you to a concert because you said oh, he was a terrible geez. person and you got only <laughs> one good thing out of the relationship? I, I really, I got just, I, Jill Scott, I left with Jill Scott and I, I consider myself lucky because of it. Uh, we, had a, we had some other drama going on there, which uh, will be in my forthcoming book. October oh, 25th. In October, oh. in October, all the details, uh, Jamel all Hill, details. as you've never heard her. Number three. <laughs> uh, number three um, is going to be uh, Prince. Okay, so, and I know it seems bizarre to have Prince at third at anything, but I saw Prince twice. I saw him once at the Palace, and this was the year that the Pistons won the title. And uh, Prince, I never will forget, he came out um, on to, to do this particular set of his concert. He had on a Tayshaun Prince jersey, and uh -huh. he did it all acoustic. And he said, just basically yell a song at me and I'll do it. And he sat there and riffed on other people's songs for a solid 15 minutes. And he did all their songs better than they do their songs. Um, and not to mention, as he is, is customary with his concerts, he does a 20 minute version of Purple Rain to end every concert. And it's, it's, it's always different and it's always glorious. So I saw Prince, pre-Jehovah Witness Prince which was nasty prints where you got insatiable <laughs> and him humping the floor prints. Yes. And then I got post Jehovah witness prints, which is still a great prints, but he just didn't do as much of the nastier content. You know, you didn't get the um, international lover prints. You know what I'm saying? Pretty so, table bitties. <laughs> <laughs> That's my song. First of all, the, the, the tickle bitties. <laughs> no, tickle. Well, <laughs> I have them. They're not my thing. <laughs> That's a jam. But though. church, it, yeah, no, church girl. Oh, that that is that. That's my song of the summer. Even though summer's almost over. Number two would be Michael Jackson. Um, when I was six years old, I saw the Jacksons. I should say to be more accurate. My stepfather won tickets off the radio. Talking about a once in a Mm -hmm. million thing that happens he won tickets off the local radio station we were in nosebleed seats at the silver dome in pontiac michigan which doesn't exist anymore where the lions used to play and that was maybe the greatest concert i've ever been to because of the fact that it's michael jackson it's the jacksons and you know when they do that move where they touch each other's shoulder and then they all look ahead and point i think i might have passed out <laughs> I, I think i blacked out at that moment and i was six so it's kind of and now of course number one is Beyonce. It's kind of sad that the Silver Dome no longer exists, but the Lions still do. <laughs> Should be the that's, other way around. That's messed up. Me. <laughs> there, there was <laughs> there was a time we were talking about uh, trying because it costs like a million dollars to buy it as a bachelor pad if you were willing to pay the taxes because it was in such a state of disrepair. Before we let you go though, Jamal, I did want to ask you uh, about everything that just happened with Deshaun Watson. We're gonna have Mike Florio on, uh, Florio on here in a little bit to talk about. Uh, the mechanics of the legalities, but uh, what was your takeaway from everything that happened yesterday and was in the report for, by the independent arbiter? Uh, you know, it, it, I'm not sure if, I can't say what is when you have that many, um, you know, civil lawsuits pending concerning the, the serious nature of what he has been uh, accused of. I don't know what's the number, right? So in a way, I, I don't want to sort of stray into the territory of saying like, oh, it should have been 11 games or 12 games or, or this or that. It's not about the games. It's about the fact that some of the things that this arbiter sort of admitted were disturbing and just didn't really coalesce with what the punishment that was actually issued. So you can't tell me in a ruling to say that Deshaun Watson, in, in you know, looking at the facts and your expert judicial opinion is such a predator that he should not be able to have masseuses outside of the Browns facility, but yet here's six games or saying things 
like in the report referring to what he put some of these uh, young women uh, through as nonviolent sexual misconduct. What does that even mean? So once again, the language around how we talk about sexual assault, misconduct, those sorts of things is the most bothersome part. Where you, I read the report and what I got from it is like, oh, he's a creep, but he's not a dangerous creep. And I don't know, and, and I'm just, again, uh, appalled, disappointed, as I often am, in just the message that that sends to women, which is often that we just have to tolerate the bad behavior of men at the risk of our own personal safety and discomfort and just kind of live with it because there are just not enough corrective measures uh, in place that will actually check this behavior. Once again, it remains fully on women to police the behavior of men. And so I was more disappointed in the report and the ruling that was issued um, than I was in the actual punishment because of the message that it sends. The optics of this are bad. You know, at the end of the day, Deshaun Watson, it, this is only going to cost him in terms of salary, you know, what, $330,000. Um, he's going to settle, I'm sure, some of these lawsuits. So this, and everything that he's gone through, I mean, and I realize that his personal reputation is obviously taking a hit, but there was more reward in this than there was actual consequence. And that's the part that always will disturb me. A lot of people are looking at the fact that he didn't play last year and try to make that some sort of punishment when it wasn't a punishment. That was trade strategy. That was not a punishment for what he was actually accused of. So once again, here we are back into the familiar hamster wheel of telling women that they don't matter. And when it comes to the issue of, uh, of sexual violence and sexual misconduct, um, our safety will always be leveraged, will always be compromised, if not completely overlooked. Um, as long as you are able to cheer on your favorite athlete. He got rewarded with the biggest contract for a quarterback in NFL history. That was his consequence for all the things that he has been accused of. And I know there's going to be a litany of people, um, especially men who, you know, uh, already have flooded my Twitter timeline. And I'm sure after hearing me talk here, we'll talk about the court system and, well, you know, he was never charged. And the people who say that really don't have a firm understanding of what happened with sexual, what happens with sexual assault in court cases. Ultimately, in many of these cases, it's about one person's word against the other. The number of false reports are so low, and they try to make that sort of the excuse and the reasoning as to why, um, you know, someone like Deshaun Watson should be should receive the benefit of the doubt. Now, I don't know what happened. I cannot obviously speak to his guilt uh, or innocence, but I do know that if you're accused of this type of behavior this many times, everybody can't be lying. Everybody can't be after your money. And we're talking about women across multiple states who have no connection to one another. And if you read some of these complaints in detail, you will see that there is a very clear disturbing pattern of behavior the rate of conviction for sexual assault and misconduct is very low it's what it is and so we don't even have a ju judicial system that is adequately set up and prepared to deal with this issue so in many ways i should not be surprised that this is the outcome in dealing with a arbitrator who is linked to a professional sports league I thought it was oxymoronic, nonviolent sexual assault, that those things couldn't exist in the same phrase without bouncing against each other. What did you make of the female arbiter defining violence the way that she did, defining uh, danger the way that she did? So uh, <clears throat> I'm going to speak to this, Dan, from a very personal standpoint. You know, when I was about, um, let's see, 11 or 12 years old, um, I was nearly raped by the friend of... Uh, uh, by the my mother was very close to a woman and her brother tried to rape me when I was that age and thinking about that encounter and how this judge termed that phrase was such a soul crushing thing to read yes I was able to escape my attacker without being physically harmed emotionally damaged for sure always will be um, in many respects but to tell women who have experienced what I experienced, even worse, and just because 
there wasn't an actual rape to tell them that what you have gone through is, uh, well, you weren't raped, so not that big of a deal. Uh, it's just it's just crushing. I mean, it, it really is because, it, uh, you know, as somebody who survived something like that and had to fight off an attacker when I was that age and I'm dealing with a grown man, you know, I mean, just because he didn't hit me in the face doesn't mean that there wasn't some kind of damage left. And uh, I think for a lot of people who have survived or even been assaulted, um, you know, this is just uh, that's the kind of language that makes it dangerous for women out here. You know, my mother's a, a rape survivor. There have been other women in my family who have been sexually assaulted. And so to see that and think of them, um, you know, it made me quite emotional, Dan. So I, I, I just, um, the callousness of those words, you know, we talk, I know some people have probably taken it and use it as a, 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 um, a catchphrase that they put right in the basket of, of woke and other terms that we have termed to, to, you know, sort of be meaningless. But rape culture is real. And that, to me, is a significant... Um, rape culture won that day when people read a phrase like that. Jamel, always good talking to you. Thank you for being on with us. What are you <laughs> laughing about, Mike Ryan? You are <laughs> roaring with laughter. Mike Florio, Pro Football <laughs> Talks founder, is with us. And we need to introduce him uh, correctly here because the man uh, is a bit of a legend. I don't know if the a bit is diluting it too much because he created something out of nothing. A media empire uh, got to the football trough, information trough before everybody else and his story is interesting because he went from law to make a career in a very difficult business. So let's introduce him correctly with Amin has been working on his broadcaster voice and uh, we were told that his book Playmakers, How the NFL Really Works and Doesn't is available wherever books are sold. Uh, what's that about? Oh, <clears throat> in recent decades, the NFL has simultaneously become an athletic, financial, and cultural powerhouse, and a league that can't seem to go more than a few weeks without a scandal. Whether it's about domestic violence, performance-enhancing drugs, racism, or head trauma, the NFL seems to always be in some kind of trouble. Yet, no matter the drama, the TV networks keep showing games, the revenue keeps rising, and the viewers keep tuning in. How can a sports league or any organization operate this way? Why do the negative stories keep happening? And why don't they ever seem to affect the bottom line? In this wide-ranging book, Mike Florio takes readers from the boardroom to the locker room, from draft day to the Super Bowl, answering these questions and more, and showing what really goes on in the sport that America can't seem to quit. Known for his constant stream of new information, an incisive Are you commentary. reading the entire book? <laughs> <laughs> Florio delivers again in this book. <laughs> With new insights and reporting on scandals past and present, this book will be the talk of the league, whether the league likes it or not. Oh, Goosebumps. Can, yeah. oh, wow. can, you, can you say yeah, the autumn wind is a pirate? Wonderful, I'm getting the audio book. Uh, How many millions? We should have hired him to do the audio book. <laughs> if I had any idea. Uh, Mike, thank you for joining us. Legally, just legally, can you take me through what it is that this arbiter ruled and what you found most interesting legally? Because it seems to me like whatever it is that she explained, she just landed on precedent, on precedent, and uh, was going to not go much further than six games. Legally, here's the most significant aspect of her decision. Legally. Because all that matters from her decision as it relates to the next step in this are her factual findings. Doesn't matter that she decided to suspend him for six games based upon her factual findings. What matters to Roger Goodell or his designee is what those findings were because those are binding and cannot be changed. And she found, Dan, that he did it. She found that the testimony was credible that he did it. She found that his testimony was not credible. She very politely called him a liar for a categorical denial of any wrongdoing whatsoever. That gives Roger Goodell, if and when, and I think it's a matter of when, not if, the league chooses to appeal the decision to the league itself, everything he needs to say, thank you for your service. Thank you for the findings. We disagree that it should be only six games. It will be whatever I, the guy whose name is on every football, chooses it should be. So this, even though at first you had Browns fans who were like, oh, it's only six games. Yeah, it's only six games for now. The most significant fact 
is her findings of fact, which allows the commissioner to do whatever he wants. You're the first person I've heard say that. I've been wondering in these three days, is he actually going to end up doing the quote unquote right thing by taking all the power back, ignoring and nuking the arbiter, the system and going right back to no, I make the rules. And that is the system. That's what the union agreed to. They agreed to an idea that they'll have an independent person make the first decision, but the commissioner still has final say. So the person with final say has all the power. And I remember when they were selling the new CBA to the players two years ago. At one point, I saw it sold as they're going to have an independent person make the final decision. And then you get the actual document. It's like, that's not what it is. The guy who was judge, jury, executioner, and appeals court is still the appeals court, and that's all that matters. So as it relates to this issue, Dan, and more broadly, the power balance between management and labor, the league's not going to give up its right to be the final say here because it's a reminder of the union. If you don't like it, let's go back to the bargaining table. If you don't like it, come take it back from us. You gave us this power and we're going to use it. I fully expect them to appeal and I fully expect the suspension to be more than six games. Is there additional reporting with that or are you just following the breadcrumbs of legality here? This is just my experience as a lawyer and 21 years of covering this sport every day. Everything I know about the league, everything I know about Roger Goodell, and based on reading that ruling, it all points to Goodell being motivated and pissed off, frankly, about the outcome and the finding that not only did he do it, but he lied when he testified about what he did or didn't do. I just think it all adds up to a significant suspension. And remember this, Ray Rice, two-game suspension in 2014, Video comes out of the knockout punch in the elevator. It almost brings the house down on Goodell. He resolved at that point, I believe, to never be accused of being too lenient with a player again. That's why Ezekiel Elliott got six games. Never arrested, never charged, never even sued. He got six games. We're still in that mode. We're still in that mindset. He's not going to allow himself to be scrutinized and criticized for being too lenient. I, I just think it's a matter of time before he bangs the gavel on something more than six. And I wouldn't be surprised if it's a full season. I'm not saying it will be, but I won't be surprised if it is. What's easiest for him to do? Like, what is the nobility? If he really cares about this, if they want to signal to tomorrow's female customers and the mothers that they've been marketing to with, we want your kids in the future. We don't want America's precious resource of football players to die because uh, women don't want to be around our sport. What is the easy play here for Goodell? What is the hard play? What do the owners want from Goodell? Well, and that's one of the keys here because he's going to talk to the owners, the ones who run the league, five, six, seven of them who really have the power. And at one point I thought maybe guys like Robert Kraft and Jerry Jones would counsel against pushing this any farther because they got dragged into it before Judge Robinson because one of the arguments is you've got to have proportional punishment when you're disciplining a player given that the personal conduct policy says owners will be held to a higher standard and we've got folks who either haven't been punished or weren't punished enough. But they kind of fell out of this. They didn't take a lot of shrapnel in the 15-page decision from Judge Robinson. And I think they could get to the point where they're confident that if this thing goes forward, if there's a federal lawsuit that's filed at some point, they're not going to be dragged through the mud as part of it. We'll see. But I think that's a factor. But the easiest thing for Goodell to do is just say, look, we've agreed to this process. I have the final say. It comes back to me. And Dan, look, we already know that the league employees who were handling this hearing wanted, on behalf of Roger Goodell, a full season suspension. So I... I don't see why he wouldn't want those same employees to push for the same thing. And then he makes the final decision. It really is ridiculous when you think about it. The league is appealing the decision to the league. So the guy who tells the league employees to appeal the decision is the guy who's handling the appeal. It's just one big dog chasing its tail. But at the end of the day, it's going to end up where it wants to be. But the arbiter is saying you don't have the right to make up the rules. The arbiter is saying these things are collectively bargained. The arbiter is saying even he's though he's guilty of those things, you don't have the right to make unprecedented rules as you go along, Roger Goodell. You don't have that right. We read those pages. They're going to ignore that part of it and just going to take what the independent arbiter gave them as ammunition. I see nothing in the CBA or in the personal conduct policy that requires Roger Goodell to give any credence to her application of the personal conduct policy to the facts. 
The only thing he's stuck with are the facts. And this gets a little bit too into the weeds legally, but a lot of times when there's an appeal process, there's some sort of standard of deference that is given to the judge's decision. It's only overturned if it's arbitrary and capricious. It's only overturned if it's an abuse of discretion. There's no standard like that here. The way I read it, as long as he doesn't introduce new facts, and in this case, he doesn't need to, he can do whatever he wants. He can pick whatever number he wants, and there's nothing that anyone can do about it the way it was bargained by the union. He's got final say. And I expect him to exercise final say. What difference does it make that he is now at odds with the union that continues to try to come after this power in various ways? And through collective bargaining, he does not have to treat them as partners because here he can be iron fisted commissioner who does whatever he wants. We've seen it from day one. I remember when he became the commissioner in late August of 2006. I started to hear from people that I know who deal with these disciplinary issues that all of a sudden they're not cutting deals anymore. All of a sudden, everything's going to a hearing. All of a sudden, the league is taking full advantage of the power that it has. And so many of these things are, are rigged. They really are. It's set up for the NFL to be the one who makes the decision, whether it's the John Gruden case where he's trying to fight and so far has been successful in keeping the case out of arbitration. Brian Flores and the other coaches suing with him, trying to stay out of arbitration because the league creates its own in-house system for dispensing justice and it's dispensed by roger goodell or his designee which means whoever he taps on the shoulder that's going to do whatever he wants them to do so i think this is no different than what we've seen for the 16-year tenure of roger goodell he has power and he never hesitates to use it mike i i found the browns approach yesterday so misguided because throughout this entire process deshaun has maintained his innocence, hasn't apologized, has shown zero contrition, and the franchise has stood by him, and now they accept the results of this investigation. Stefanski went on record as saying that. Well, the result of the investigation is this person did it. The things that people were saying about him was he did it. And their first statement on the fact was, this might be triggering, he has shown contrition, which was a lie. Now how do you reconcile that? Where, where do the Browns go from here? Because I thought they totally botched it yesterday. They now know that the person that is running their huddle is a serial sexual assaulter. Well, and I think the statement that was issued by ownership yesterday, and you referred to some of it, it's basically poking the bear in the ass on a day when the bear is already upset. Why are you trying to, to shame Roger Goodell into not exercising his right to appeal the decision to himself? It, it had echoes of what the union did on Sunday. We were like, hey, we're, we respect the decision. They knew. They knew where, which way the wind was blowing. We respect the decision. We call on the league to do the same. Yeah, we call on the league to give up its power to put a different decision in place of the one that's made by Judge Robinson. I think it was horribly misguided by the Browns. And you're right. They say we accept her decision, and he's been remorseful all the time. Well, if you accept her decision, you have to accept her decision that he's shown no remorse. So you're not accepting her decision if you're rejecting whichever parts don't fit with your narrative. I just thought it was a horrible mistake by the Browns. And at a time when there's already people pissed off about the contract, fully guaranteed, five years, 230 million, sets a precedent that other owners have to deal with. They're just asking for more trouble and they're asking for a longer suspension by handling it the way they did yesterday. I want to ask you some questions legally, and I suppose we could do this with you every week with the NFL, but the Gruden and Flores lawsuits, what were the most interesting things in there that you're that you're following, and where do you think those things are going to end up? Well, let me start with the Gruden case, because he's already won at the trial court level the question of whether or not the case stays in court or goes to arbitration. The NFL will appeal that as far as they can. With the St. Louis relocation case, the NFL appealed the question of arbitration all the way to the US Supreme Court. Now the court didn't take on the case, but it bogs it down. I think the Gruden case is gonna be bogged down through multiple layers of appeal, but eventually we find out who ordered the code red. Eventually we find out where those emails came from. Were they from Goodell? Were they from Dan Snyder? Small universe of people had those documents that were weaponized against John Gruden. It's a balancing act. Because you could say he got what he deserved, but also, wait a minute, this is a big secret investigation. They're going to carve off five pages and give them to the New York Times, or the Wall Street Journal, and get a guy run out of his job. So we're going to find out who did it, and we're going to find out what else may be in those documents as well as part of it, but it's going to take some time. Same thing with Flores. There's going to be an extended fight on whether or not 
the case should be an arbitration. And what they're trying to do now, and I haven't seen a ruling on this, they want to engage in discovery. They want to take Roger Goodell's deposition. They want to find out what he's been paid. They want to find out what bias he may have in being the arbitrator for matters involving the teams. And that's been an obvious problem for years. And nobody seemed to have an issue with it. Wait a minute. The guy who's in charge of the sport, who gets paid $60 million a year by these owners, is the guy who's designated to resolve lawsuits brought in-house against these same owners. Well, how's anyone who's pursuing justice ever going to get a fair shake when he's deciding cases involving the people who pay him? So they're really making that a big issue. And, and it's overdue. We just kind of accepted it because that's always the way it's been. But it's just inherently wrong for them to expect to have what I call a secret rigged kangaroo court in mm. every situation where someone is trying to get justice. When you mentioned six or seven owners run the league, uh, I assume that Bob Kraft was one of them. And I assumed that all that ownership stuff uh, was about his incident here in South Florida and them looking like, never mind higher standard. He's uh, dabbling. Fo we never saw photos. We never saw anything. Everything vanished. It's rich people making everything go away. Explain to me how Bob Kraft plays into some of the inner workings on the Deshaun thing. Well, one of the best arguments that I thought going into the hearing was this idea that the personal conduct policy says, black and white, like fourth, fifth paragraph, owners are held to a higher standard. Owners will be subject to greater discipline than players. So Jeffrey Kessler, who represented Watson in this, decided we'll make an issue out of that. What about Bob Kraft, who was charged with solicitation. Charges were dropped because it was an illegal effort to capture these images and there were people who were victims in this. There was a class action, I don't know how it turned out, but people who just went for massages were being secretly videotaped in various states of undress. It's a horrible way for the police to do business. The case went away and my understanding at the hearing, it was acknowledged that they investigated Kraft, but they didn't impose any discipline on him. Now the difference is, the difference is he was never accused of, of trying to engineer a sexual encounter out of a massage. The sexual encounter was was given to him during the massage. So it wasn't the same as Deshaun Watson, but that dynamic became part of the hearing. The fact that Jerry Jones, the Cowboys voyeurism scandal that kind of bubbled up and then disappeared earlier this year that I thought should have been a bigger deal. That was mentioned. Daniel Snyder was mentioned. It didn't get a whole lot of traction in her ruling, though, because she was more focused on the precedent, the notice that the players had regarding what punishment they would face for this kind of issue. But if it goes forward, it could come back again. And in every case where the NFL tries to discipline a player under the personal conduct policy, they need to be ready to face the argument that if there's any similar case out there involving an owner, you failed to have the same standard and you definitely failed to hold that owner to a higher standard. The fact that the arbitrator said flatly that Deshaun Watson was lying when we are the NFL and we expect cooperation with our interviews. And if you don't cooperate, the penalties will be even stiffer. Yet more ammunition for this theory you have that this will be appealed. Roger Goodell will appeal this to himself. The absurd sentence of Roger Goodell <laughs> is going to save the day heroically and it's going to be the right thing because he's going to ignore everything that was done here, all the money spent on lawyers, take just the facts that he wants and do the right thing. And I think it will motivate him to do it. In the past, when there have been examples of someone lying or trying to obscure the truth, they've been more motivated. Remember Tom Brady, the destroyed cell phone. That made them more motivated to suspend him for Deflategate. The Saints, a decade ago, with the bounty scandal, they had been questioned about it. They had supposedly lied about it. That made him more motivated. And th there is something to be said for expecting people to tell the truth when there is a quasi-legal proceeding and you're put under oath and you testify. If you don't tell the truth, you know, it's hard enough to figure out what the truth is if the witnesses are, are committed to telling the truth. When you start lying, you obscure the effort to get to the truth. And once Goodell figures out that that's exactly what she was saying, I think it makes him more upset and more determined to ramp this up from six games to whatever he's going to do, full season or whatever he chooses to do. Florio, you and I are in the same camp, not understanding how it is that Tom Brady almost coming to the Dolphins with Sean Payton was not a bigger story nationally. I don't. Please explain to me why no one cares. 
Well, here, here's where I get in trouble. No one cares because ESPN didn't report it. NFL Network didn't report it. So it was never made a big deal by them. It never became the talking point for three days of Sports Center and every studio show. It never got traction because ESPN ignored it because ESPN didn't break it. And I assume that Schefter knew about it. And maybe this is just one of those third rails that he's not going to touch because he's a Michigan guy and doesn't want to piss off Brady and he's tight with Don Yee and Yee represents Peyton and Brady. And maybe the table was set for Schefter to be the one to break it to the world if Brian Flores doesn't file his lawsuit. But I guarantee you, if Flores doesn't file that lawsuit the same day Brady announced his retirement, the next week Brady's announced as a minority owner of the Dolphins, not long after that, Sean Payton is the head coach of the Dolphins. And at some point, May or June, Tom Brady unretires. They work out a deal with the Buccaneers and he becomes the quarterback of the Dolphins. It was happening and it could still in theory happen next year. I doubt that it will, but it was happening earlier this year and Flores derailed it. That's a, it's amazing. How is that? Again, a racist lawsuit by the coach <laughs> derails Tom Brady becoming a Dolphin and nobody cares. Uh, and you don't have, that's your theory on Schefter. You don't know what's, uh, that uh, we were theorizing that perhaps being burned by the fact that it wasn't actually a retirement, that they caught the luckiest break ever. Man, you don't have to pile on. He laid it out rat a tat tat so <laughs> what was going on there. It was clear and well done, Mike. Okay. Great hair. Very good. Well, uh, well, well, here's my prediction. Week one, Sunday, ESPN, NFL Countdown, they'll report it as if it's brand new. That's what I'm waiting for. Uh, good talking to you. Good <laughs> oh, maiden good voyage on the show. And you uh, you nailed the dismount, sir. What about Kyler Thank Murray you, question? guys. <laughs> what about your Kyler <laughs> Murray question? <laughs> Oddly enough, not guilty of tanking. Just guilty of saying Hey, I don't care about our win-loss record. I'd like one of those low picks, but never instructed anybody to do what was necessary to get the low picks, which would be losing. So the sting of the Brian Flores lawsuit, which we wondered aloud, uh, what's happening with that might have had some seam let out of it right now. But uh, the big news is the, the punitive measures that the NFL took and the fact that now we have punishment. Can this story gain traction nationally because they got punished for their pursuit of Sean Payton and Tom Brady? If you're just joining us now on YouTube and have been with us for the Mike Florio stuff, you would think this was planned because Florio's last answer in the conversation that we were having for the podcast and on YouTube was about a story that has gotten uh, just weirdly not covered very much, given that you're talking about one of the greatest winners of our time and an epic incompetence that ends with the Dolphins not illegally getting him for what would have been tampering draft picks, but losing him and Brian Flores leaving. And again, I'm going to say this again because I think it's one of the most shocking things to happen in my sports lifetime. Tom Brady was saying goodbye to just the Bucks there. Tom Brady, uh, Adam Schefter, and Jeff Darlington had reported he was going to retire. He wasn't going to retire. Mm. He was coming to the Dolphins. He was just saying goodbye to the Bucs, and it's why he didn't say goodbye and thank you to Boston. He wasn't retiring. We all got it wrong. Like, that's a thing that happened. <laughs> yeah, I mean, honest to God, you can't make that shit up. The idea that the greatest winner of our time, the reporting around him was so sloppy that he tried to just say goodbye to Tampa, a lawsuit happened, and then he couldn't retire. He was coming to be the Dolphins quarterback in a move that would have made him part owner and maybe doesn't even net him the job of settling for $375 million as a broadcaster for Fox. Dan, the exact quote from Commissioner Goodell. The investigation found tampering violations of, of unprecedented scope and severity. I know of no prior instance of a team violating the prohibition on tampering with both a head coach and star player to the potential detriment of multiple other clubs over a period of several years. Similarly, I, have, I know of no prior instance in which ownership was so directly involved in the violations. They started contacting Brady when he was still a Patriot. In 2019, that's when they started flirting with Tom Brady. Uh, Pay Sean Payton started a little later, started in January 2022. So not as bad. <laughs> yeah, let, so let's outline the full scope of... The penalty of draft picks. Let's go through the draft yeah. picks and yeah. what these penalties are. So it's a 2023 first-round draft pick from the Dolphins, a 2024 
third round draft pick. What they were found guilty of, as as Amin pointed out, the Dolphins had unpermissible uh, contact with Tom Brady in 2019-20. This included both owner Stephen Ross and the owner in waiting Bruce Beal, who has also been penalized as a result of this. The Dolphins again had impermissible contact with Brady during the 20 after the 2021 season while he was under contract in Tampa. Those discussions began no later than early December 2021 and focused on Mr. Brady becoming a limited partner in the Dolphins and possibly serving as a football executive. Although at times, they also included the possibility of Brady playing for the Dolphins. In January 2022, the Dolphins had impermissible contact with Don Yee, the agent for New Orleans Saints head coach Sean Payton, about having Mr. Payton serve as Miami's head coach. Miami did not seek consent from New Orleans to have these discussions, which occurred before Coach Payton announced his decision to retire as head coach of the Saints. And also, we have the other aspect of this, which is the tanking accusation, which had been filed against the Miami Dolphins, notably by Brian Flores in his lawsuit. Now, the Dolphins did not intentionally lose games in 2019, the report says. However, it did say that Stephen Ross expresses belief that the Dolphins' position in the, 20, the upcoming 2020 draft should take priority over the team's win-loss record. These comments are made most frequently to team president and CEO Tom Garfinkel, but were also made to senior football executives. Brian Flores expresses concerns in writing to senior club executives about this, each of whom assured Coach Flores that everyone, including Stephen Ross, supported him in building a winning culture. One such comment is claimed about paying $100,000 to lose games, as to which they're referring different recollections about the wording, timing, and context. However phrased, such a comment was not intended or taken to be a serious offer, nor was the subject <laughs> pursued in any respect by Mr. Ross or anyone else at the club. So they're basically saying... The Dolphins did not intentionally lose games. However, Stephen Ross did jokingly offer $100,000 for a loss and did say they prioritized a, a draft pick over a one-loss record. So everything except go and lose games. This makes me feel better about Stephen Ross as an owner. As a Dolphins fan, <laughs> he's going for it. Interesting take. This man was going for Tom Brady. <laughs> this guy was going for it. I'm in on this. <laughs> he was going for Brady and This Kuro. is the opposite of the Deshaun Watson thing. I, I wouldn't want that associated with like this guy. Not not fair. Not <laughs> with the rules. Takes, not the <laughs> whatever it takes to Deshaun win. Wow. Is not the opposite. I'm saying that. it's like you Today's know obviously a good day for Stephen Ross. <laughs> and no one this, else is saying that on this, earth. This is this is Chris's Zion busted yeah, to the show. Is good Zion right. publicity no. is good publicity. Guy, the, you don't want the, the, Stephen He's Ross trying. had the Dolphins in this moment. Like they were just terrible. No one cared about him. So he's like, what can we do? Let's go get Brady. Cheat. Like, I mean, hey, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> hey. Yeah. If you're not cheating, you're not trying. That is uh the league though frowns on this. Yeah. Hey, you bit. think you think he's the you think this is the only team where something like this has happened? No, where things just are... the only team stupid enough to get caught. Yes. Okay. Right. Uh I'm gonna push back on that. I do think this is the only team trying to give a court a quarterback for a division rival dating back to 2019 and ownership sake to convince him to come aboard. And then years later, while he's on another team after he's won another Super Bowl to continue on that, I'm going to say this has never happened before. That's what they say about that all the pioneers. <laughs> <laughs> That's what Roger Goodell said. That's right. He said, this has never happened before. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he did. He did say, uh, Greg Cody, Miami Herald columnist <laughs> roaring with laughter. Do you have any commentary on a, on a scandal with the local team that has this, this ownership group, Stephen Ross has been uh, only with Jeffrey Loria. Does he go in the conversation as worst owners we have ever had in South Florida yeah. has presided over consistent disasters and apocalypse uh, two decades of the team, not mattering, not interesting trading in what was once the winningest franchise in all of sports of Marino and Shula desecrated all of it. And now in his eighties, desperate, a real estate tycoon, hugely desperate to just win in the boys club. He just got kicked out of it in a rare penalty for an owner. The owners employ Goodell. The owners, you, you say this, you say this, what are you doing? I mean, he's, He's fined a million and a half, and he can't do anything until October. Oh, no. Yeah, that's what a, not much of a penalty. What a harsh penalty. <laughs> oh, I'm not in the Zoom meeting. <laughs> thank that's you pocket for taking, change. Yeah, thank you for taking two weeks of useless meetings off of my docket. That's incredible. What, what, a, what a great day for Stephen Ross. Yes. Here, here. They are stripping him of all his committees, though. He is removed from all. He is removed from all league committees. Flogging him with shame Ooh. and fine one point five million. Like, killing him with feathers. I mean, it's important for NFL owners to have their power, right? Like 
Steve Ross wants to be a powerful owner within the NFL. They're basically saying he's kind of Al Davis now. They're, 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 that's right. It's There's shame involved, but instead of capital punishment, it's a week of tickling. <laughs> Like it's, 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 it, yes, we will shame you. You are off all the committees, and yes, he didn't want to go to any of those committees. He's still waiting for that task force to gather of <laughs> Curtis Martin, Jason force. Taylor, and Don yeah. Shula to preside over the bullying scandal That's of Richie right. Incognito. When are they meeting again? That uh, <laughs> no, they that never committee. met. We have oh, no okay. proof. We right. we need to do a thirty for thirty. We need to do an audio oral <laughs> history chasing down if there were ever any phone calls between these people. Stephen Ross trying to investigate the Richie incognito bullying scandal. Let's think about what Stephen Ross has presided over. The cocaine coach with the uh, the offensive oh, line coach scandal. Coach. Okay, yeah. fine. The bullying scandal. Forrester. Nick Saban leaving. That uh, was before that was, Stephen that was Ross. Wayne. That was yeah. just before Stephen the Ross. The orange carpet. Yeah, the orange carpet. Yeah. The orange carpet. Yeah. The Tony Serena. Segreto hosted orange carpet. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. The no uh, no playoff anything. The it's, relentless losing. The T Pain remix of the oh, fight song. Oh, oh, you have no, that? No, don't don't no. <laughs> no. It's a Miami Dolphins That's song. Okay. What are your thoughts no. here, Greg? On on um, on really an, another embarrassment for the Miami Dolphins, and now one that costs you because you want your coach to or you want your owner to go for it right up until you start getting punished with future picks that are valuable. Even by Stephen Ross standards, this is. Uh, an outrageous uh, scandal, an outrageous... What, trying uh, to get Tom Brady on his team? Yeah, because A, you cheated, and B, you cheated badly, C, and that's... you got caught on both counts. What C? <laughs> C is T-Pain. Uh, a and B are enough. Hey. Hey. Let's go. Miami and the Dolphins, the greatest football team. We take the ball from goal to goal like no one's ever seen. We're in the air, we're on the ground. Gas. What? What? How do you have a Super worse gas. take than the one you already had? Gas. Like Zaza. in the bathroom? Like gas? Indigestion? Zaza. You're 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 <laughs> claiming that the T Pain, the Dolphin song, stolen from the Houston Oilers, not even original. Really? I believe that's right. Isn't it stolen? There's great debate on that. Is there? Yeah. Let's exhume Lee Offman and the writer and ask him. He wrote the book, Dan. He would know. Greg's run out of gas. This is about an hour past <laughs> his <Yeah>. expiration date. <laughs> I'm, I'm a little distracted right now. I, uh, He's got to write a column. Yeah. He's got another cut on his finger. What's happening? You came in with a bandage. You haven't talked in about 90 minutes. You've been disoriented by the lights yeah. in here. <laughs> the lights? <laughs> no, but uh, this is just the same mess. Uh, you know, it's uh, don't worry about me. I'm fine. Your... Your thoughts on the level of incompetence. You're going to have to go home and write a column. Yes. Yeah. Uh huh. What are your thoughts? I don't. I, I, I dad, your, zig, you, are, dad, zig when everyone else is zagging. Take my take. Write yeah, a column. I'm not, not going to take your take. I'm the, I'm the one who's already. Uh, <laughs> Greg, that's a great idea by your son. Please for the show. Take the. T please for the show. <laughs> just throw throw one into the stream. Take, take a position no one can okay. see coming. Everyone will click on it. Everyone listening right now will go click on yeah, that. I'm going to let pass. Christopher have that take to himself. No. It's such a great take. I Greg. mean, go, Stephen Ross, what an owner. Having all this initiative to Trying do to what get the nobody best else would do. ever in history. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. There's a little thing called tampering. <laughs> You're not allowed to do that. When someone else is under contract in the NFL, uh, it never another happens team in the NFL. is not allowed to make an overture and I'm try sure to steal him. It never happens. It never happens. Nobody ever reaches out to anyone before contracts. You're right. Everybody else in the league is doing it completely and the Dolphins Different. are Different, the yeah. Okay. They're, not owner, they're not offering you ownership guys think stakes. That there's no the other best quarterback of all time. You guys don't think there's any other tampering going on in the NFL. You think this is the only example of communications before contracts, little under the tables, hey, you should leave here, come here. I'm not like... I like, like it. I'm, I want to sell what you're... I want, <laughs> let's convince Greg Cody tomorrow can write the column that says, terrible, shame, shame, Dolphins. You're so bad. You're incompetent. How can you be the dirty cheaters? And, and no, not a lot of people will read it.
You want to bet? <laughs> you want to bet? Not as many as will read what I'm saying, which is if you write the other side of this, if you write the preposterous take of your son, okay, I want the owner who cheats and thinks about his own mortality when trying to win in a desperate fit at the end. To or get just Tom goes Brady. after the best quarterback, right? right? Just uh, trying to make his team great. Chris, That's what he wants. That's your, what he's trying to your get. opinion has been framed as preposterous. I agree with Thank you. you. Well, I, I don't agree think it's with that you. Preposterous. Don't you just want your owner to go and win? That's all you want. What do you want for your owner? Number one, spend as much money as possible. Number two, do everything you can Crawling to desperate. win. Crawling desperate. You don't if think it's, if it's tanking for the number one overall pick, if it's offering an ownership stake to Tom Brady, it's everything you Cheat can to, the to win. You think, you think if Jerry Jones or uh, Robert Kraft are in the offseason and they see some f- a player that's going to be up for free agent in a year or two, you don't think there's little, like, hey, man, hey, maybe when you... What was uh, that? That was your, your rationalization for ownership has somewhere in the Smoking Mountains Jimmy Haslam nodding in approval. <laughs> <laughs> no. See, there's a line. He's not hurting. There's a line. There's a line. There's a line. You're right. Tamper the normal way. No, that's right. right. <laughs> Tamper, try to get a free agent. Normal tampering. Yeah, not, not cheating. Not ownership stakes. Don't go after a player that's done something like Deshaun. Jimmy Haslam, bad. Yes. Stephen Ross going after the best quarterback <laughs> not ever. Good. Not as bad. Not, not good, but not as bad. That's right. That's a good slow. Also, for the Stephen Dolphins. Ross failed at getting Deshaun Watson. That's I just what he's so Jimmy good. Haslam bad. Just wanted that said. So good. The Dolphin slogan should be "We're not as bad as the Browns." Tampering violations of unprecedented scope. <laughs> We're not as bad as the Browns. Yeah, the <laughs> We're not as bad as the Browns. The company, uh, the company letterhead and the official statement should be like, man, six games is light. You need to look at those guys. <laughs> and, and also, I mean, invited in a lawsuit onto the NFL. I think this whole statement yeah. from Roger Goodell is, thanks for that lawsuit, asshole. <laughs> 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 yeah, I don't got enough problems. <laughs> I don't have enough problems. I, again, though, I, I'm going to just... Put- My name is on the football, <laughs> Steve. <laughs> we underreported in America's most popular sport that Tom Brady didn't intend to retire. I'm going to keep saying it because it he was coming to the Dolphins. Him. And it was nuked by a Brian Flores lawsuit that Roger Goodell just responded to right. <laughs> minutes ago with get out of here, get off my committees, give me some of those picks. I I, I get out of here. Like <laughs> what are you, Dan, you fool? Dan, you fool. We suffered through conference realignment talk, tennis, and Cody Fajardo helming the Saskatchewan Rough Riders. <laughs> But just like that, <laughs> August <laughs> is back. Yeah.